Hello, hello, true seekers all over the world. This is Matthew from Back to the Covenant. I hope you're having an amazing day wherever you're at in the world. Maybe you may be watching this. So I'm super excited about this. This is my first time doing a hosting a panel discussion. So if you saw the thumbnail for the video, it might be a little deceiving. So I want to apologize in advance. Zach from My House Ministries is not able to make it. So, but his partner in crime, Micah, is here representing My House Ministries. And I also have Matt from TorahIsLight.org as well. So I had, I'm going to be doing by, joined by two gentlemen that have been studying the Zadok calendar for years. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to ask them questions and they're going to do the best to answer them as in-depth as possible. So if you're in the chat and you're watching this live and you have a question about the Zadok calendar, do me a favor and put it in all caps and I'll put it to the side and we'll try to get to, after I get through my list of questions, we'll get to your questions in the chat. So again, if you got a question in the chat, put it in all caps so it'll stand out so I can put it to the side. So let me say what's up to a couple people in the chat, and then I'll bring Mike and Matt on. What's up? Eye on the prize, Toby, Don Carey, a homesteading hustle. I like that one. Let's see, Dennis Bachman, Tess C374. There's Tyler. Drew's in the house. All right, I got my local peeps. They probably have some good questions. Gina Siska and Wendy. Oh, Miss. Wildly popular is in the house and Mojo Shop. So let me bring Michael on real quick. Shalom, shalom, brother. Shalom, shalom. How are you? Great. How about you? Doing well. It's good to be here. I'm uh, looking forward to taking all the questions you fire at us tonight. Yes, sir. Let me bring Matt on. So this is going to be the Matt and Matt show <laughs> and Michael. <laughs> Hello, Hello, brother. So, how you doing? We got three things going. Been really good. Thanks for having me on. I'm blessed to have you, brother. So, if y'all are ready, actually, do y'all want to? I don't know if y'all want to share in the beginning a little bit about yourself and your ministry, and maybe how you got into the Zadok calendar. Before we get going, sure, go ahead, Matt. Uh, well, um, I guess. A little bit about me. Uh, my wife and I are both Torah observant, and uh, we came into this walk in late 2015. And, uh, from there, you know, there's a lot of unknowns, obviously, uh, especially about when you start the year and all that other things. And so we kind of fell into the, you know, I guess the traditions. You know, we, we did follow the lunar calendar to begin with, and I was challenged on that by a friend of mine. And uh, he, he challenged me to look into Enoch and the Zadok, and I did. And I found a lot of conflicting information, a lot of stuff that just didn't make sense. So I sat down and mapped it out in, in an attempt to disprove it and uh, actually came to believe it. Um, but also uh, along that path, um, our, our fellowship was looking at, okay, well, what calendar do we follow? And none of us could really come to a consensus. And uh, so I decided that we would uh, we would write down all the dates that we could come up with on the different calendars that we found. And uh, I, I wrote those on stones and prayed over them for three or four weeks. And then we decided to fast for a couple of days and then actually draw lots. Um, I know some people are opposed to that, but it's all through scripture. And I kid you not, every one of us that drew out of that bag through the same stone, except for the guy that challenged me on it. And it was for the date of the Zadok calendar that year. And um, that set me back, I mean, on my heels. It made me think that um, there's something to this because that doesn't happen. The odds of that were um, very, very slim. And so that's really kind of, um, besides looking into it and trying to disprove it, now I had this I had to deal with and grapple with. And so I started to Try to figure out, okay, what is special about this? And um, as I got into it, I mean, now today I'm, I'm more convinced that it's the right pattern. I know there's still some questions that we have, and we're going to go over some of that tonight. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I'm absolutely convinced that the, the basic pattern that we have is is the right pattern. Yeah. Yeah. I'm right, brother. I agree. <laughs> So for me, um, just to try to make this quick because I think I shared it on the last video we did, but uh, yeah. I had been searching the calendar out um, 
for the year prior to finding this calendar. So I think it was like 2017 when I when I had been searching, trying to figure out which calendar was right. And I had looked at so many different calendars, Lunar Sabbath, um, the traditional Hillel, like the Hillel type calendar, mm -hmm. um, Enoch 360 calendar, uh, you name it. I mean, pretty much any calendar that's that's out there online, I looked at even some really crazy far out ones, just trying to figure out what in the world uh, and, and none of them made any sense. And so then we come to spring of 2018. I think it was March 19th. And most of the people I knew had already started the year two days before. And I, and I had at Sukkot the year before I had just prayed on the last day of Sukkot. And I said, Father, if you want me to be on your dates, I'm done seeking out the calendar right now. I can't do it anymore. I've done, I've done it for a long time. I, I need you to show me what your calendar is. So I can start on your calendar next year. And so on the 19th of March, uh, I was painting my daughter's bedroom and I just put, put on a YouTube video to watch. And this was the calendar that came up uh, on the YouTube video and it answered all the questions, all the other calendars that I had looked at couldn't answer. It answered every single one. Um, and it just made so much sense and it, it felt right in my spirit too. Everything just checked off and uh um and then when i re re really looked into it found out two days later was the start of the year so he showed me the calendar i was supposed to be on two days before it started it was just amazing <laughs> wow that's awesome uh, yeah so, so if I, ready? yeah we're ready uh we're if good. you were done all right mike i want to throw this question to you because me and you were on the phone the other day and you had you you articulated this very well so why why is the canon alone not enough to come up with a complete calendar so and matt feel free to jump in to you know if uh you have thoughts as, as yeah, I'm definitely. Showing, but but um so basically if you look if you look through the entire canonical scriptures uh you can find dates there's all kinds of dates mentioned and of course, in Leviticus 23, it tells us what the, the Moedim are, the feast days. Um, it tells us the dates for them, what days of each month. But that's, that's really all you find calendar-wise in the entirety of the canon. There isn't anything else, really. Um, there's no, uh, no person going out to sight a moon. There's no, uh, there's no mention of us needing to sight a moon. There's no nothing that tells us when a year starts, how long a year is, how long a month is, none of that. Yep. So you're left you're left just trying to figure piece something together and come up with the best thing you can come up with. But there's really no calendar when in the book of Enoch, uh, and it's backed up in a lot of ways really well in the book of Jubilees, yep. uh, it literally tells you the calendar. And I personally believe that the book of Enoch was considered scripture uh, all the way up until um, well after the time of Messiah by the apostles as well. And there wasn't a calendar in canon or in, there isn't a calendar in the canon we have today because it's in Enoch. It wasn't needed in all the other books. The book of Enoch, right. So I don't know if that, if that covers. I'm hoping my answer is as good this time as it was the other day on the phone, but... Oh, yeah, that, that was more detailed than on the phone. So that was good. <laughs> Any so, thoughts, Matt? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. I mean, I, I don't see any need to really, like, why would they need to have it in another place if they've already got it documented? And, you know, I think yep. the Jubilees, yep. like you said, and Enoch both found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, they're, you know, uh, Jude quotes Enoch directly. I definitely think that they were at least circulated among those that were studying religious texts at the time, and, and they knew it. Right. Right. Especially the Ethiopians, because it was in their canon. Sure. Yep. And I think there's reasons also, why it was left out of the canon. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's something to research, everybody at home, on your own time. There's a lot there. Yep. Yep. So here's a good follow-up question. Do you want to either 
one of y'all or both of y'all want to give a short, basic explanation of what the Zadok calendar is before we get into the like detailed questions. This, this is just for anybody that might be watching the video later that's not in the live chat. Do you want to take a stab at her? You want me to go for it, man? I know it's hard to give a like super quick <laughs> explanation. Sure. Best yeah, as you I can. Mean, the, I mean, the Zadok calendar is basically, uh, you know, it's found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It takes a little bit to work through it, um, but it sets forth a pattern, and it's based upon the Mishmarat or the, the circulation of the priestly courses. And, and that's really how you can sit down and delineate where you are in, in the calendar. Uh, understanding the, those priestly courses that comes from uh, was it First Chronicles 24, when uh, Zadok, uh, the high priest, and David divided up the, the Levites, or um, the sons of Aaron, uh, into courses. Uh, we later see that in Luke 1 with um, uh, Zechariah. Uh, he was from the line of Abijah. So that they carried that forward. And uh, so that's where the name Zadok comes from. It's just because it's tied to, to the priestly courses. Um, but the same pattern, again, is found in Enoch, uh, Jubilees, and, and the Dead Sea Scrolls. We just get a lot more information out of the scrolls um, than we do the other two books. But it's yeah. it's mainly... I, I, go ahead. I was just going to say, just the simplicity of it. I mean, it takes a little bit to, like Matt said, to get past your preconceptions of mm -hmm. how everything works. Yep. So that can be confusing, and that's the real problem. But the calendar itself is simple. It's easy. It's, super simple. it's 12 30-day months with a season-changing day between each of the months. That's all it is. Like, it's not complicated. It's super easy. And then you just plug Leviticus 23 into it, and you have your calendar. It's, su it's super simple. Yep. And it's divisible by 7. It's divisible by 12. Um, it, yep. it works out perfectly, to be honest with you. Um, Amazing, amazing, <laughs> amazing easy yeah. math. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I firmly believe our creator is a mathematician. I mean, you, you look at creation and, and fractals, and you see it in everything, and you see it in the calendar. His fingerprints are all over it, where, you know, oh, yeah. you get other calendars that just go all over the place, and there's really no no peg anywhere that kind of nails it down, where this here, it does. It nails it down, and then you know exactly where you are. As long as you got that starting point right, you know exactly where you are in the feast town. Yeah. And somebody in the chat made a comment that I I agree. Christy said, I think it's uncomplicatedness that throws people off. <laughs> it's like people want it to be complicated. <laughs> it can't be real calendar, it's not complicated. So I agree with the sister that said that. So it's true. It's yeah, true. It, it, it is and, and and it isn't. Um I mean, I, I'm, I got a history as a, as a mechanical engineer, so I'm very numbers-based in my head. And yeah. you look at it, on, on the surface, the calendar is incredibly simple. But when you look into, you dive into Enoch and the movements of the sun and the moon and how everything times perfectly, it's like a giant watch. But it's, you know, it's just the way the movements work and they align uh, is, to me, it's it's incredibly complicated thing to put in place and to have it be so precise yeah. yeah that's why understanding Abba's creation is so important especially when mm -hmm. you're trying to figure out how to do his calendar and his feast days that go along with the calendar too so so that's a side nugget all right here we go so let's jump into the the detailed questions that i've compiled how do you start the year and why <laughs> well um that one is a very complicated question. Um, Matt, uh, Matt has done a ton of research. I've done a ton of research on, and so have a lot of other people, um, on why we should start it a certain way versus another way. Because there's, there's, you know, a number of different methods you could use to do it. Um, but, and I think, Matt, you should definitely jump in on this, too, because you have a, a different perspective from your mathematical uh, side that I don't. Um, uh, but anyways, uh, the one of the reasons that we chose to use the method we're using was because we cast lots. Because, at least for me, I'll speak for myself, I looked at 
you know, all those calendars when I was looking at the calendar, just in general, trying to find which one to use. Then after I found the right calendar, I looked at probably at least 10 different methods, probably, probably more like 15 different methods of how to start the year. Okay. And out of those 13 methods, I compiled a list of seven that I thought were plausible possibilities. And this was back in uh, 2019, at the beginning of 2019, right before the year started. And I asked Matt and Zach to look through them, and no, none of us really could come up with one that we knew for sure was right because um, – this one topic, there's not a lot of scripture that specifically tells you how to do it. So, yeah. um, so we uh, decided, agreed after Matt's experience and sharing his experience with casting lots, we decided that that was the method we needed to take because we just couldn't settle on a method. And we had to make a decision that year if we were going to intercalate and add a, an uncounted week between the years, between the 2018 and 20, or sorry, yeah, 2018 and 2019 years, or if we were going to um, wait it out another year before intercalation and maybe no intercalation at all because we put that on the table too. And um, we all three, the first draw drew number four out of the, out of eight numbers that we put in a hat. The eighth one was for other in case none of the options that we had listed were correct. So we all drew number four. And number four just happens to match a pattern that um, I, I found a pattern in the moon that every seven years with an intercalation, uh, there's this moon flipping pattern, which I don't think we should get into be, uh, in this call super deep, but I do have, I can send you, if you wanted to post it with this video, like as a, a link in the video, I have yeah. a video where I explain the flipping pattern, but it's, it's, it's complicated to understand and it would interfere with the rest of our questions and stuff. But anyways, <laughs> it's a, a seven-year pattern of flipping from full moons for three years and then new moons for three years um, that uh, actually seems to have some – I mean, it seems to work. So anyways, that was what the lot fell for, and that meant that year we didn't intercalate. We actually waited till the next year to intercalate till 2020. And you can correct me if I'm wrong on my dates, Matt, but I think that was. The no, case. you're right. Yeah, it was uh, at this 2019 is when you had a big alignment that a lot of other people right. associated with uh, assigned to intercalate, which was when you had the, the equinox fall on the fourth day. And there was a new moon on that day as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like you, we were going through all the alignments that we could find. And, yeah, it was. It doesn't happen often, but to me, it, it didn't trigger. It didn't have the same feel, I guess you could say, um, that we needed to intercalate. And then when we plugged in the pattern that Michael was talking about, along with some other things, um, the dominoes just kind of fell into place. Yeah. And I think the biggest yeah. reason there was a question that year was because the equinox fell on a Wednesday, mm -hmm. but the full moon also fell on the same day, which is one of the signs mentioned in the Dead Sea Scrolls um, that you're on track, basically. And so it was kind of hard to ignore that the full moon landed on that day, even though the equinox happened that day. Um, and some people believe that you need to start the day after. Um, and there's some valid reasons why, but we, you know, when the lot fell that way and um, the full moon happened that day. It just seemed like that's what we needed to do. So, so. Yeah, this, this question will be kind of tied into some other ones here later on, too. Right. Because um, right. we get in so. specifically to the issue of intercalation and, and why okay. why we start the year the way we do. Yeah, I was yeah. going to bring that but up yeah, later. Yeah, that's, that's a good way of our starting point, yeah. Yeah. So since yeah. we're on the topic so. of when it – oh, yeah, well, don't go ahead. No, I, that's fine. We can continue on because we will address what I was going to say later. So we'll just keep going. Yeah, some of the stuff y'all brought up are in the questions later. I'm trying to build up to the meatier ones and just give them a little milk up front. <laughs> yep. So since we're talking about the the beginning of the year, starting the year, you want to explain the difference between the equinox and the equilux and which one we should look to when starting the year? 
Yeah. So, so go ahead, Matt. You you know. Uh, it's just, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So yeah, the equinox or the equinox right. to me, it's just simple. It's a super simple answer. The equinox is seen on the entire Earth, every or all on the same day. The equilux happens on different days of the year for different latitudes, depending on how far you are, you are away from another latitude. So, I mean, it, and it's a pretty wide range. And then there's some places uh, on earth that don't even have an equilux. So to me, it's like, how can, how can you use that as your method when you have a clear sign that happens everywhere on earth on the same day? Yep. So I, I will, I will point out too in, in that though, um, the equinox, you can only see it for two years in a row and then you won't see it because it'll happen in the nighttime hours where you're at. So it's not really a, it's not a sign that we can see with our eyes. It's something that we would have to calculate. And that's where I've right. kind of gotten to the understanding that the equinox or, or equilox, whatever. Um, it's not, it's not a, it's not a hard, fast day. It's, it's just a sign. It's just like some of these other right. things that are, uh, yep. You know, you have the end of the 364-day calendar. You have you have the equinox or the equinox, whichever you're looking to, and you have the signs in the moon, which I'm going to like to get to in a little bit. But all of those are just indicators. They're not, um, you know, it's not like we, we say, oh, well, the equinox happened, so we have to start a year. They're, right. you know, Genesis 1, you was putting the, you know, the sun and the moon and the stars for, for signs, for Moed, and for, you know, for seasons. Mm -hmm. for, so they're not, I don't think they're like, a hard kite in the ground that we have to go off with her and they're just simply indicators yeah. that the time is changing well the one thing i will add to that is um uh, well two things one i agree with you and i think the equilux can be used as an earlier sign to prepare um mm -hmm. which i've i've seen a couple of the calendar groups out there you know suggesting that you, you use the equal equilux as your like initial sign that it's coming and then um, that gives you your, kind of like your warning. But I have been tracking the equinox on a board for since 20, since the spring of 2019, because I wasn't able to track it in 2018. I wasn't prepared. So since the spring of 2019, so for three years, I have tracked the equinox. Um, I've tried to do it spring and fall. I've missed a couple of them. But even though in a sense you can't see it, except for every couple of years you do get on a if you put a, a peg in a board or a bolt i use a bolt in an old door um if you if you put a peg up <laughs> no it would be, well i mean it wouldn't be quite like that that is a cool calendar but no if you have a spot that gets morning to evening sun it doesn't yep. have to be from early sunrise but it needs to be from like maybe 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at least. Um, if you can get earlier and later, that's even better. But anyways, if you have a place that's that's full sun all day, at least from 10 to 5, and you have a peg in a board, what you can watch is for a few um, days before and a few days after, you'll see that the you, you, you mark the tip of the the shadow that is cast by the peg every like every hour all day long yep. and then you put a straight straight edge across those lines and before the equinox the lines will make a curve one way the day of the equinox it will make a perfectly straight line and then the day after and and going afterwards the line will curve the other way um so if you get data collect data from like five days you can clearly see which day was the equinox day or the equal day and night um because it's a straight right. line that's cast on that board and uh so there is a so way to measure that. right that, that's so, where so I step would say that that's the equal box so you're but saying as simple it's, as yeah. shadows and sticks getting the yes <laughs> yeah well, and i what? wouldn't disagree with you Matt, that that would be the equilux, but that's the it just happens to almost always fall on the day that the world says it's the equinox. So sure, yeah, it's, it's pretty equilux. close. I mean, 
it's the difference between like the sun moving across the equator versus us having equal day, right. equal night. And that's where yep. I know it's going to vary um, depending on your latitude. But I mean, I know that's where you have, um, I can't remember what they're called, but it's the sundial kind of like Jerry Morris had where it had the, the two hoops. And when you align that uh -huh. to um, the North Pole or the North Star, then that gives you more of an right. accurate uh -huh. representation because you're actually right. taking in your, uh, uh -huh. your, your latitude and I, into account there. Yep. I'm trying to find a and picture. I actually, of what you're talking about. I actually about. made one of those and used one of those. I think they call them an equatorial sundial. Um, yes. The problem yes. I found is it's very difficult to uh, actually line that thing up to the um, to the North Star, to Polaris, because if you do some right. research, Polaris actually makes a small circle. Everybody thinks it it's, it's stationary, but it makes a real small circle, and it's enough that I would go out at, like, midnight and sight that thing in, or maybe, like, 11 when it was really good and dark and I'd sight that thing in on the North star and then I'd go out like at three or four to check it, to make sure it was right. And it would be off. I could tell it was off. So it's, you actually, I, I found I had to like aim somewhere in between, which means you're not aiming right at the star now. And it, it, it was very confusing. I actually couldn't get a very good reading on that one, but the, um, people lux that the world tells us in here in like in the United States, for instance, um, it's typically like around the 17th, 16th, 17th, I think it's the 16th, um, is when the equilux is. So that's, you know, about four days before what I would call the true day of equal day and night, which is the, the straight line day, whatever day that is. Right. So, but the, that was what I was going to say on the equilux. Um, sorry, I got sidetracked there, but on the equilux, um, it's it's hard to use. It's hard to use that day because it's um, it's different in different latitudes. Um, but we can use it, like I was saying earlier, we can use it as a sign and in a, a preparation for that day. And I lost my other thought. There was three parts to that. So if I remember yeah. it, I'll bring it back up. Well, that's that's what I was getting at when I was saying I, I think it's just a sign. Uh, I think it's it's an indicator. Yeah. If they if they were using a, a peg in on a round or flat surface, which uh, some archaeological evidence uh -huh. proves that that's what they were doing, then it would be a little early, uh -huh. and again, it would be a sign uh, that hey, we're we're getting right. close. So, yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. So, how about? Why is Wednesday based on the fourth day of the week of creation? Why would we do that? <laughs> Wednesday is in the name of the week, well, or Wednesday, just that it happens to be? Yep. Yeah, being the fourth day of the week. As in the fourth day of creation. Matt, you're really good on this one. Why don't you Why don't you share, Matt, your studies? Because I haven't studied as much on um, what you found as far as Shabbat being on the right day of the week. Oh, yeah. So I get a lot of questions about uh, the Gregorian calendar, and a lot of people are really kind of put off with it because of yep. the, the pagan associations with the names of the weeks, um, you know, like Mondays, Mars Day, Tuesday, you know, uh, or uh, Monday is Lunas Day. I mean, you, you don't just are lunar, so Moon Day. But um, right. our English, English language is relatively modern. In, in the course of human history. Uh, and it's a conglomeration of a bunch of different languages. It, it's it's quite difficult to actually understand if you're not raised in it. And um, so the fact that it has names doesn't bother me one bit. You look at, um, and there's probably 70 or 100 languages that are in existence still today that are used that many predate uh, English, every one of their names for the seventh day of the week directly translates to Sabbath. Uh, Spanish, again, Sabado. Uh, Italian is, you know, pretty much the same thing. Um, I think Greek is actually Sabaton. So you have all of these, yep. I mean, and, and English language was based upon uh, Greek and Latin mainly. And those two, again, it's directly translated as Sabbath. 
And so either the entire system shifted or, you know, and all these languages adapted uh, to that, or the Gregorian calendar just happens to line up with a, a system that was already in place and it was just named after these different entities. So the, the fourth day of the week, uh, being the week of creation, or being based on the week of creation, and that's when, um, you know, the sun and the moon and the stars were created in the first week. And so the sun and the moon and the stars are the basis of all calendars, um, whether it's a lunar calendar, a solar calendar, uh, or anything. Everything that are a seasonal calendar, everything's based around those heavenly bodies. And so that the calendar in and of itself couldn't have been created until the fourth day. And when you read through the Dead Sea Scrolls, that seems to be pretty apparent that that's where, um, not the day of the week or the day of the, you know, but the day of the year where the calendar itself begins. It was on the fourth day. Because this, that's when all the luminaries were placed inside the Father's creation. Right. Yep. Yeah, before yep, that, you that had day, light. all the luminaries. Yep. Yeah, so all the luminaries were pl placed there, like you said, and uh, you didn't have those to track the calendar until that date. And that's what it literally says in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It says on the fourth day of creation, and then it says, you know, basically says the calendar started. So um, and it says there was a full moon on that day. It seems to say that anyways. I mean, it, in some respects, we, we do have to be careful because we we're just reading English that was translated by someone who believes that it says that. But um, but anyways, it would seem that a, there was a full moon on the first day of or the fourth day of creation. And that was when the luminaries were put into motion. And then ever since then, uh, and, and we know that we can't track a calendar if we don't have luminaries. So it would make sense that that was the day that it all started. And, that, and then when it says that in the DSS and the Dead Sea Scrolls, it seems like a second witness. So. Sorry, hold on a second. For all the mods in the chat, can you do me a favor and help with the spam? Because this is getting pretty bad. I apologize, guys. There's a lot of spammers. So this is this is an awesome, awesome stream if there's we're getting all this spam because normally it's not like this. So, okay. Now that we got that out of the way. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Well, I can't even see it, so. Yeah, I can't either. That's good. I'm, I'm, good. I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a lot. And I accidentally blocked somebody. I didn't mean to on accident, so hopefully I can unblock them. So why, no, no. why, so why is Passover on Tuesday? All right, Matt, if you can pull up, um, pull up that PowerPoint. Sure. Um, right. And I think that this will help. Um, it's going to go down a few slides, and it'll say timing of Passover right at the top. But um, it's probably, I don't know, a third of the way down, and there's a lot of slides in this, unfortunately, so you're going to have to search a bit. But but while he's searching there, um, Passover has always seemed to be on a Wednesday prior to me, prior to keeping this calendar, because I believed that, and this one, this one can be a hard one. It was really hard for me, actually. I had to, I had to totally go back to the drawing board and open up, you know, the possibilities that maybe my preconceptions aren't correct here. And I fought this one for a while, but the, the consensus typically is that that Messiah had to be crucified on the real Passover. Otherwise, what's what's the point? Yep. And interestingly, in Matthew, Mark and Luke, in all three of those Gospels, it says that uh, on the day the lamb Passover lambs were being sacrificed and two of them say the first day of unleavened bread, I believe uh, that Yahusha sent the disciples to go and prepare a place to eat the Passover. So you have three witnesses telling you 
that the lambs are being sacrificed, which is supposed to be done on the 14th day. Mm-hmm. And two of them say it's the first day of unleavened bread. And the 14th day is the first day that you eat unleavened bread. So that would fit the first day of unleavened bread. <clears throat> um, and there, then he tells them to, eat, to go prepare the Passover. Then later on during the evening, he says, I have desired to eat this Passover. So um, to me, it would make sense that if we have three witnesses telling us that he ate the Last Supper on Passover, that's probably what he did. And what I had to get out of my mind was, yes, he's our Passover lamb, but he wasn't a literal sacrifice. The instruction says you're supposed to slaughter them, the lamb in the temple. You're supposed to uh, roast the flesh over a fire, eat as much of it as you can, and burn the rest of it before morning. None of those things happened to his body. None of them. So he's not, and he's not a literal sacrifice. That's not what he was. So yeah. in that, in that they have atonement. Too. He's a, go ahead. Yep. No, say so yeah. He, he's our he's our atonement. He's our sin sacrifice. He's our peace offering. He's all those things. Uh, you know, the sacrifices foreshadowed what he would do as our high priest. But you know, right. he wasn't sacrificed or slaughtered like you said in in the way of any of those that were prescribed. Right, and he wasn't sacrificed you know? like you just said. The day of atonement either so he couldn't be our right. atonement then if he's not sacrificed on that day so so it, it also states very clearly in the dead sea scrolls that passover is on the third day of the week it states it in several places yes, exactly and, uh, it's, 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 and it's right uh, up here on the screen yeah mishmarat right on the 14, screen it says, yep yep I've got three of the places from the Paso or from the Dead Sea Scrolls listed on this uh, slide on the screen. Um, I didn't list the, uh, you know, location, the number, document number, or scroll number, but uh, I have them, and Matt has them. So yeah, if you go to the next slide on this, there's there's two more slides I think for the timing of Passover. So here's the three accounts of that I mentioned from Matthew, Mark, and Luke of what said on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Yahushua and asked, uh, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? And then on the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover, Passover lambs were being sacrificed, his disciples came to him and said, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? So, I mean, it, it just seems to be that that was the day of Passover. And it's it's been well documented all over the place. You can even find it on um, the Jewish Encyclopedia and several other, you know, very prominent Jewish websites that there were multiple calendars in play at that time. And there was great disagreement over which one was the correct calendar. So it would seem as though he was on this particular calendar and uh, not on some of the other ones out there. If you want to jump to the next slide there, Matt, this will kind of just show how the... um, yeah it'll show so you've got Passover on Tuesday and then um, you know he ate the Passover that day then he did die I believe on Wednesday and then you have Thursday, Friday and Saturday so he's in the ground from Wednesday night so you have three days and three nights if he rises before uh, sunrise like on Shabbat can I share oh. another screenshot real quick? Yeah. Yep. Uh, let's see here. I gotta try to do this real quick. And then share. And we'll, I'll we'll bring it back here. Share screen. Yep. So this is basically our version of the of the same calendar that you're showing there, Micah. But. Um, what we got, yeah, it's the three days and three nights. You have the sign of Jonah, as as he declared. And the other thing that's interesting is if you go back to Deuteronomy, or is it, yeah, Deuteronomy, where it talks about um, 
where the, the camp where they stopped and camped during the Exodus, the night of the Exodus. So they, they came like we had Passover evening. Then that morning they left out. That night they camped in Sukkoth. The next night they camped in Ethanim. Then they camped in Hyaroth. And then the night of the Shabbat, that's when the, the Red Sea crossing happened. And it's the same time that Yeshua rose. Yep. So it, it, it matches perfectly yep. with the Exodus pattern. It matches perfectly with the, the sign of Jonah. You can't get it to fit if, if, uh, if Passover was on Wednesday. Yep. You go back Amazing. To your, uh, well said. I told you, Matt, we're supposed to surprise us. <laughs> Don't hold back on us, brother. Bring bring it. <laughs> There's your every time I talk with Matt, he's got a new a new thing that's really awesome to show. Yeah, so I think that was all on the Passover one. We do have, I don't know if you want to just quickly touch on the timing of first fruits, because that on this slideshow. Or PowerPoint is the next slide is the timing of first fruits. We could just hit that one quick. Yeah, just knock it out and I'll take I'll delete it out my list. That works. Okay. Oh, that was two questions away. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. So Matt, if, if I don't know if you can jump to the next slide, or maybe you have a night. There we go. Okay, so uh, one witness here is Mishmarot D or Q325 from the Dead Sea Scrolls on the 25th day in the first month is the Sabbath of the week of Yediyah. During the same week is the Feast of Barley on the 26th day in the first month after the Sabbath. So we have, and there's a couple other witnesses in the Dead Sea Scrolls too, that um, that first fruits falls on the 26th day of the first month. Uh, not during, it's not during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And this one was another hard one for me because, again, it's got to be our first fruit offering. So he's got to, he's got to, uh, uh, it's got to happen on the Sunday or the first day of the week um, after he, you know, the day he rose. But that's not what it seems to say throughout Scripture. And if you really look deep and dig deep, uh, to me anyways, you want to jump to the next slide there, Matt, and feel free to jump in with thoughts too. Yeah, well, that that term there after the Sabbath seems to get a lot uh -huh. of people confused. Um, so they think, yeah. well, you, you know, you have the, the traditional or uh, the Jewish mindset where it's after the Sabbath, so the Sabbath would have been unleavened bread, or you have, you know, the the weekly Sabbath, which would have been the following Sunday, uh, which is a more common. Um, thought, but with the Dead Sea Scrolls and with the Zadok calendar, all of the feasts are kept separate. Uh, you got to think of it from a priestly perspective. If you had these overlapping feasts, if you had, you know, you got Passover and then unleavened bread, just read Leviticus and see how many animals these people had to sacrifice on those days. And each day on unleavened bread, they had another sacrifice they had to perform. It's and a so lot of sacrifices. Right, if you had the second day of unleavened bread was also the first, you know, the day of first fruits. Uh, that's a lot going on. Same thing on the following Sunday or the first day of the week. It would, you're still in unleavened bread. Um, plus, you know, it, it diminishes the individual feasts themselves because now you got this overlap. But um, right. So next slide, you said, or yeah, here we go. Sorry. Yeah. We're good. Are you able to zoom that in a little bit, make it bigger, Matt? Yeah, I should have made the text bigger. Sorry, guys. Um, I might be able to. Let me enable it. Yeah, no. there's, a, there's an option to zoom in, so okay. it should, you should work. Now, hold on. Hey, lost it. <laughs> So while, while Matt's trying on this, basically what he, what he's trying to show there on screen is in order to prove out when first fruits was, I went out to Shavuot and looked at some, some examples of when Shavuot was observed and where it's located in the calendar according to some of these different texts. And you see in Exodus 19.1 that in the third month after the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt from that very day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. Sorry, I'm looking over to my other computer that I have this on. Um, 
And then in Exodus 24, it says, okay. It could be my, my screen's lagging a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So then it says, he arose early in the morning. This is Moses in Exodus 24. And he built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent uh, young men of the sons of Israel and they offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings. And he took half the blood and put it in basins and the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people and said, all that Yahweh has spoken we will do and we will be obedient. So he took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and behold the blood of the covenant which Yahuwah had made with you in accordance with all these words. So we know for sure with this uh, passage that this is the day the covenant actually happened. I always tended to believe it was Exodus 20 when Yah was speaking to the people, but this is when the covenant was ratified. And in the book of Jubilees, if you want to jump to the next slide, Matt, I can't remember actually what I have on here, but in the, in the book of Jubilees, um, it tells us that um yeah right uh no this is a difference this is right stay here but what i'm talking about in the book of jubilees it tells us in um chapter six of jubilees that uh the day of shavuot is a twofold feast it's the first fruits of the wheat harvest and it's the uh day of the renewing of the covenant so all in the interesting thing in the book of Jubilees, if you haven't read it, it dates all of the events that happened from basically creation, all the big events from creation to uh, right before they entered the promised land in the um, 50th Jubilee. And um, so it tells us in a whole bunch of different places that all of the covenants like Abraham's covenants and Isaac was born on, on um, Shavuot. All these different things happened on that day. Okay, so it's the day of the covenant. So when the when the blood is shed and sprinkled on the book of the covenant, that's the covenant day. Then in Exodus 24, it says, Now Yahuwah said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and remain there, and I will give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandments, which I have written for their instruction. So we arose with Joshua's servant, and Moses went up to the mountain of Elohim. And then we, if we read in Jubilees, it gives us more information. It came to pass in the first year of the exodus of the children of Yasharel out of Mitzrayim, in the third month, on the 16th day of the month, that Elohim spoke to Moshe, saying, Come up to me on the mount, and I will give you two sapphire stones of the Torah uh, and of the commandment which I have written, that you may teach them. So we know that it had to be the day before if we pieced exodus and Jubilees together. So... So it would seem to be that the 15th day of the month is Shavuot, okay? If you want to go to the next slide, Matt. Um, basically, if you count backwards from the 15th day of the third month, you're always going to land on the 26th day of, uh, even if you don't use this calendar, even if you use the traditional, like the Hillel calendar, you're still going to end up outside of um, um, unleavened bread. You won't fall within, if you count 50 days backwards, from the 15th day of the third month. Um, you won't fall within unleavened bread. Um, and here's some examples of places where it tells us that it's in the middle of the month is when first fruits falls. And uh, if you want to go to the next one, Matt? Yeah. And I apologize, guys. I didn't realize I couldn't share... Uh, PowerPoint. This is my PowerPoint. Matt's having to share it for me. Um, oh, this is the, this is another one that's not related. So I think that pretty much covers it, though, from my perspective. When you count backwards and it comes outside of, uh, it falls on the 26th day of the first month, and then you have witnesses in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and then also, um, like Matt mentioned, the feast to me, if you read Leviticus 23, it'll say Yahweh spake unto Moshe, saying, and then it talks about a particular feast or moed and then it goes to the next section yahweh spake on the moshe saying and then it tells the next one and um yeah. first fruits is outside of unleavened bread and after it it's the next yahweh speak on the moshe saying so to me there's there's multiple witnesses to it not being within that week right and it's interesting too that you had the events of Noah offering a sacrifice after he left the ark happened to be right in the midst of the third month. You had the birth of Isaac right in the midst of the third yep. month. 
Um, you have, yep. I believe, you can tie back through Luke 1 and historical events to prove that Yeshua was possibly, you know, born in the midst of the third month. Uh, and if you if you look at it from the context of, you know, the Dead Sea Scrolls and the renewing of the covenant, what did he come to do? He came to renew the covenant in his blood. Right. So, you know, there's there's a lot of these parallels that that just start to, to come into play when, when you look at it in that way. Yeah, there's a lot of significant stuff. If if you've read the Jubilees all the way through, there's a lot of significant stuff that happens at or around the feasts. All through the book of Jubilees, yep. it's, it's very interesting. Yeah, I think I think Shavuot's a much more important feast than uh, we give it, you know, yeah. credit for. And there's not a lot, of, you know, if you look at just the canon, there's not a whole lot of information to go off of, other than waving yep. two loaves of leavened bread. Um, but right. there's definitely a significance <laughs> yeah. when it comes to you know the covenant and, and the renewal and, and the time of refreshing with the people, uh, you know, getting back to where we should be. I think there's a lot more there than, than we really realize. Yes, sir. I, I'm with you, Matt. And I, I think that, uh, you know, interestingly, both Passover and Unleavened Bread and Shavuot are pilgrimage feasts as well as Sukkot. And everybody keeps Sukkot and gathers for Sukkot. But really, from what I see in Scripture, they would have all come for all three of those feasts and probably been there for about a week every time, tenting around and in Jerusalem. So, yeah. Yep. All right, on a totally different topic. So how does the moon play a role in the Zadok calendar? Because that's a lot, a lot of people that object to the Zadok calendar say, what about the moon? Well, I might have touched on that earlier yeah, with uh, with that pattern of the flipping between new moon and uh, full moon. But there's also something that we can look at in Enoch. Uh, where he mentions the moon sets with the sun in the great day, uh, gate or between the third and the fourth gate. And this is another yep. one of those signs that I believe help point us to um, the new year because it only happens in the spring. And, um, and what I found is every year you can go through and you can find the new moon and the full moon both on each side. Usually it's, it bookends the, the equinox or the equinox but they set within two to three degrees of the sun's position on the horizon. And it only happens in the spring. And so, yeah, I know uh, in the scrolls, you know, they, they were cataloging uh, full moons and new moons for some reason. They only got, I think, five years, was it? You know, they, they didn't really, it was at least four. that's all we have, four years. But uh, uh -huh. that could well be that they were just trying to keep track with what was going on in the temple being led by you know a different group i, I don't know but uh it definitely plays a role in in establishing the year absolutely I, I don't think it goes much beyond that though yeah so i would i would just say that um the moon it's it's such a complicated subject because the moon is very yeah, erratic it, is. it jumps all around but enoch did tell us <clears throat> Um, over an eight-year period, how many days there are of the solar year or the, or the calendar year, really, and how many days there are in the, the lunar year. Um, and there's 364 days, according to Enoch, in a calendar year and 354 in a lunar year. Yep. So every three years, the, the full moon, seemingly, some people believe it's a new moon, but it seems to me it's the full moon. The full, full moon, according to Enoch, will show up around the beginning of the year, um, marking it or, you know, signaling that that is you're still on track. And if you understand it, it's actually you don't have to wait for year three because in year two, it'll be 20 days off from the first day of the year um, or sorry, 10 days off from the first day of the year. And in year three, uh, you know, that, that'd be in year two. Yeah. Then year three, it'd be 20 days off. And then in year the the next year, where the intercalation of the moon that you see done in the traditional Hebrew calendars happens, now it comes back in alignment with a 30-day intercalation of another lunar month. It now comes back in alignment with a 364-day calendar, according to Ina. Um, and the, the Dead Sea Scrolls show that very clearly uh, with the priestly courses included in that uh, over four full years. Um, and 
there's so much in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Like if you take um, the 4Q319, which Matt, I'd love Matt if at some point tonight you just show your, just briefly share, show your, uh, your Excel spreadsheet that has that information in it to show all of the the times that Kamul and Shekinya show up over six jubilees. It's amazing. They document how how the uh, priestly courses work in just extremely precise detail, and, it, and Matt has put it all in a spreadsheet. It's just so awesome. But nice. um, the priestly courses are tied to the moon, seemingly. So I believe that, personally, I believe that the moon is for seasons, but the word Moed, Moedim actually has more meanings than just feasts in Scripture. It's got quite a few different meanings, actually. Um but even if you're only using that meaning, if you don't have the moon as a second witness to know another sign, a second sign, you don't have a second witness for your calendar, so you can't you can't keep your Moedim on the correct dates. So, so it's not, yep. according to Enoch and the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's not a sign where you follow it that day. It's a sign where it keeps us on track, just like the sun is. The sun, a lot of people think that this calendar is a solar calendar, but it's actually not uh, just a solar calendar the way that we've understood it and the way the lot fell. So there's a lot more Zach, that can be said there. but I think Zach put it really eloquently one time. He said it's, it's not about following the sun or about following the moon. It's about being obedient. You know, um, That's right. He's given us these things uh, my, for, for signs and for seasons. And he's also, I mean, the 364-day calendar as laid out in the Dead Sea Scrolls is evident all through Scripture. Um, I have on our website, I got some Scripture that lays out dates that establish the Sabbath. And it tells you the day of the week and that it was a Sabbath. You know, we have uh, when, when David entered the tabernacle and ate the showbread. So that had to have been, you know, uh, it gets renewed on, on a Shabbat. And so, you know, it's a Sabbath. And then you know that three days or four days prior to that, he was supposed to be having dinner with um, with King Saul, and he fled, and they right. were going to have a feast. So what feast were they having? Uh, it was the fourth day of the week. It was probably the first of Abib, uh, because if it had been the seventh month, then they would have been celebrating, um, you know, Yom Tura. But, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, going back to that with, with, with the moon, Oh, I just lost my thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was jumping around there, but it uh, it definitely it definitely plays a part. And I oh, I know what it was. So in four four Q three twenty eight, uh, I had a I had a group send me a big packet of, of information that they had thought they had found a correlation between the priestly courses and the lunar patterns that are given in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The hard thing with the moon is it, it runs on a 19-year metonic cycle. So every 19 years, it'll come around to the same day of the year. And uh, with the 24 priestly courses, if we go through the uh, through that later, you have 19 is prime. It's not divisible by 24. It's not divisible by 12 or anything else for that matter. Uh, and I actually extrapolated it out. If you don't intercalate, then like, that sign that we read in the first year with the full moon on the first day of the mole or on the, the fourth day of the mole, it wouldn't happen again for another 300 and I think 46 years. Right. Fourth day. Uh, if we, but if we intercalate, I don't know, that's beyond me. I, I don't have the ability to calculate that, but it, it's, so the moon is very erratic and, um, yep. You know, let me show you something real quick. I'll share this with you. Uh, While you're looking for that, I was just going to share that me and our local brothers, our local assembly, we just view the moon, the the moon, the moon as a second witness or a second sign, along with the sun, like Michael was sharing. So, yep. Yep. I thought I heard it's, it open. Here it is. And while you're looking that up too, I forgot at the beginning. So. Anybody, after we get done, if you want to do some more research, Matt's website and Zach and Micah's website are in the description. So check them out. And especially Matt's, you, you, your brain might explode because he's he, he'll get deep on you. <laughs> oh, yeah. He's a sharp, sharp got, cookie. We've got some other great information. Time, but... 
All right, so uh, let me get this up here. Yeah, I got you. All right, so I sat down. This is the first chart. I'll, I'll pull up another one here in just a minute. So this is basically taking the data that's in Enoch directly and just punching it into Excel and then throwing it into a, a chart. And what you have here, uh, the blue dots basically represent the gates. And then the the orange or yellow is the, the daylight, the gray is nighttime. So you have, yeah, at this point, in the very first, you have the spring equinox, then you have the summer solstice, uh, fall equinox, and then winter solstice, and then back to spring. Uh, but you can see how the moon, see the moon uh, does this weird thing. And I couldn't, couldn't figure out how that played in. Now let me show you the other one. A lot of clicking, sorry. Is that on your website? That was really cool. Uh, I don't yeah, know if I have I don't that or not. All right, so this here, now you take that same data and you put it into a radial chart. Uh, you know, I know there's a lot of, I don't want to really get into ladder stuff, but it, it only really works in a, in a flat model. So you have, you have this heart shape, uh, which would be the movement of the sun. And that is called a cardioid. Um, when you look at, it's basically a two times multiplication table charted in a radial fashion. And you, you have in this pattern, you have shown the, the, the two uh, solstices, and then you have the equinox would be going across here. And then what you have is this, this star pattern is the moon moving north and south every phase. Um, and it does that every month. If you watch it, it you know, it'd be full moon in the north, new moon in the south, full moon in the north, it just moves back and forward. It moves up and down too. It gains altitude and loses altitude. That's why you have, you know, super moons and, and tiny moons and, and these other things. And then you have uh, when they're directly opposed, you have weak tides. When they're, when they're in close to each other, you have uh, high tides. Uh, it, it does have a, a massive effect on this, this world in which we live. But I, I really found that to be fascinating, that cardioid pattern. Because my wife's sewing machine, I, I rebuilt one for her. It was from like 1905. And it used that same cam profile for the bobbin winder. And uh, as you go around, it has a little ball that tracks that. And it would actually show perfectly how the seasons function as the moon traverses north to south through the gate and then comes back up again. And you actually have that weird pause at either end of, uh, of the solstices where it stops. Which actually takes you, like, if you look at uh, Joshua, when he commanded the sun and the moon to stand still, uh, yep. the term there, uh, actually, that's where we get the word solstice from in the Latin. Great stuff, as always, Matt. So, just from one complicated question to another... How do y'all explain the stars in regards to the Zadok calendars? Because for me personally, I, so I've been doing the, this is my second year doing the Zadok calendar. And for about 15 plus years, I did the Looney Solar. So in Genesis 1, 14 through 17, it talks about the sun, moon, and stars. And so that always bothered me. I'm like, okay, we're doing the moon, we're doing the sun. So where do the stars come into play? And, and I could never figure it out. And so what's y'all's take on that? So before you answer, let me share something that a couple of brothers that are in the chat right now, they did, they, they brought Stellarium up and they showed, I forget what constellation it was, uh, Drew and, and uh, Toby, refresh my memory in the chat, but so they, they showed on Stellarium how the sun and the moon and then one of the, oh man, I hate, I, I forget what constellation it was, right, right when the timing of the new year and they were all aligned and it, it was like, wow. And then, and then I got a visual of how the stars play into the Zadok calendar. It's really cool. So I'll toss it over to y'all about the stars and the Zadok calendar. I'd love to see what they put together there. I haven't seen any great information on the stars yet that leads me to be able to settle on this is how you use it. The sun, the sun and the moon were a hard enough task to nail down. And even even that, we still haven't fully nailed them down. I mean, we, we, we kind of yeah. understand them. 
But, you know, I mean, it's crazy. In, in Jubilees, I believe, it says that Abraham went out on the last day of Sukkot and sat out overnight looking at the stars and was able to determine what the rains would be like the next year. Okay? We are clueless today about how the luminaries work. It's been stolen from us and hidden from us because, yep. well, you know, times and law. He wants to ch change times and law. So um, the sun and moon have taken so long just to get to the point where we are trying to figure out how they work. And the stars, there's so many more of them. And I, I haven't been in a position in my life with all I have going on to really research the stars. But um, there's, I have a couple of thoughts, and I know Matt has thoughts too on the stars. But um, I... I struggle a little bit. I'm not saying I don't trust them at all, but I struggle trusting those programs because, mm -hmm. I mean, who put them together, you know? So yeah, I just, sure. I struggle with all of the data. Even the data we've used to compile the, the information we have is all data given to us by, you know, sites like timeanddate.com, which ultimately comes from NASA. So, sure. Um, and then, in the book of Jubilees, in chapter 8, right, the first, like, five verses, it says that this this man named Canaan, uh, he found, um, I think it was a tablet, a stone tablet, and the with watchers. writing on it. And it was the teaching of the watchers about the motions of the luminaries, okay? And interestingly, that is not in the Masoretic, his name is not in the genealogies in Genesis 10, or in Chronicles, in the um, genealogies, but it is in the Septuagint. Yep. So it would seem as though somebody's trying to hide his name so people don't go and read the book of Jubilees and find out what he found. But I have questions about how almost everything, how they tell us almost everything works. And one of my concerns is, is you know, how do we even know that the constellations we've been given today are the right constellations? I mean, I, I'm not saying they're not, okay? I don't know. But if the calendar is supposed to work together, if, like, some, there's some people that keep a star calendar. They, they consider the stars to be the Kodesh, okay? And the problem is, is you have one month, I believe, that's 22 days long, and you have another month, the longest one is, like, 45 days long, and all in between for the 12 constellations. Well, that doesn't, to me, doesn't seem like it lines up with 30-day months. So there's got to be a totally different method to using the stars. You can't just line them up with the months. It doesn't and work. where do you so measure it from, right? Right, exactly. You, if you exactly. Have higher altitude, you can see further, and so your horizon is going to be different. And you're going to yep. see different, yeah, sure. you know, they're going to appear on the night sky at different points. Right. And at what point do you draw that line that this is... Again, I, I, it's, I live in Michigan, so I can't see the stars like, you know, nine out of 10 days. So <laughs> it's, it's hard for me to say. <laughs> yeah. Or Matt. But, but that's not to say the stars aren't supposed to be used. Um, right. I just, it's, so, it's such a big task to figure out how they fit in. And we haven't even figured out just the sun and moon yet. Um, so yeah. I haven't really delved into the, the stars much, but I'd love to see your friends, what they put together. I, you know, I'm always, I still use those programs. I'm not totally downing them. I, I still look at them, but I just, um, I just question them, but I would love to see what they have. So maybe we get on zoom one day. Yeah. It was yeah. Virgo. I can't remember. The constellation was Virgo okay. that they showed yeah. us. I yeah. Cause Virgo in the spring always uh, has, Right around the time of the, the beginning of the year, uh, Spica, I believe, is the star, but it's the, it's the the wheat, the like the the sheaf of wheat in her hand that starts showing over the horizon at at the beginning of the evening, right at the beginning of the year, around that time. So I yeah. think that's what I think that's what they're showing, if I remember correctly. But okay. it, it was it was pretty neat. So it was two gentlemen that was in the chat that showed that, and it was it was very compelling. I have to say. Yeah, I'd love to see it. Yeah, and that kind of gets into, uh, you know, going back to the very first question, how do you start the year? And some folks, you know, they, they look to uh, barley, right? 
Uh, so right. some people are looking to the, the, the signs in the sky. Some of them are actually looking for sheaves of barley. Um, it's odd that Abib is the only month that we're commanded to observe, to see with our eyes. Um, we're not commanded to look to, you know, the, the solstices or the equinoxes, uh, at least the fall equinox. Uh, so we're commanded to observe um, in the springtime. But, um, yeah, I lost it again. But, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I've had a long, long day. Um, but I, I, I can't remember the reference or where it was at, but there was some indication that to understand the stars, you had to study them for somewhere of upwards of 600 years to fully understand uh, how they moved and functioned. And, wow. of course, you know, the patriarchs, you know, Methuselah lived well over 900 years. Um, but I think a lot of that information has been gathered and kept for a long time. And there's some people that are, are privy to it. Yeah, just not us. Yep. I'm with you. And and I wanted to say, too, that, you know, I see people and I think and I don't want to actually I want I should rephrase this. Because I love the passion. I love to see people trying to find answers on the calendar. But sure. I just want to I just want to say that it's not as simple. OK, I do believe it's super simple. If y'all were to just download the information to one of us, it would be super simple. He could just tell us and we would know how to do it for the rest of our life. Easy. Okay. Yep. But it's not that simple to just look around, look up in the sky and be like, Oh, look, I see such and such. That must mean the year starts. It's not, it doesn't, the, the luminaries don't work like that. They're extremely precise mathematical clock. Like Matt yep. said earlier, and just as charts kind of give you an idea of how much data there is and how much they move around and what they do. We are just barely scratching the surface of understanding, and I, and I totally agree. Even if, even if we don't know the source of the 600 year thing of how long it takes to learn, it is so complicated. Just figuring out just basic things of how this works, and to think that we can just look up and be like, "Oh yeah, it works like that," it's not that easy. And no. and I want to quickly just go back and remind everybody: if you look to Jubilees and consider it to be something we should at least check out. In Jubilee 6, Yah tells Moses, if the people do not keep the calendar year, 364 days only, they will lose track of, of the calendar. So everybody thinks, oh, it should be easy. If I hit my head and wake up on an island, I should just be able to look up in the sky and there's the calendar. But if it was that easy, then he wouldn't have said that to Moses. So... It's obviously not that easy. You have to know the keys, and only he has them. And a few, maybe a few people here on Earth, like Matt said, do know it, but they're hiding it from us. Yeah, and I would say that back in the day during scriptural times, it was a lot easier for them because they were looking up at the sky every day. Yep. And they, and they didn't they have streetlights polluting it either. Yeah. Right. And all the stuff that they spray, I'm not going to say the name, <laughs> so they don't get dinged. Right. Yeah, the stars are hard. Yeah, they're okay, tough. Yeah, definitely. Do you want to? Do y'all want to touch on since you mentioned Jubilee six? You want to touch on the days of remembrance in Jubilee six twenty three? Since that's something sure. that you don't see in the canon, but you see in Jubilees when it comes to calendar. Yeah. If you would pull the the um, thing back up there, we've actually got a section of the slides. It's a, I think it's a little ways above the uh, the Passover timing of Passover ones we went through that we can pull up and go over that. But a lot of people confuse the days of remembrance or the new moon days. Um, you know, you see a lot of people actually keeping new moon days. Like they look for the moon. So they're on the Zadok calendar, but then they look for the new moon and they keep that as like a, a feast or a Sabbath day or a day of rest or whatever. They don't work or all different things that people do. And if you mm. look in Enoch, sorry, Matt, it's it's somewhere mm. in there. Well, I think uh, this actually yeah, here, I think this ties in a lot with what we're talking about right now. Uh, yeah, New go ahead. Versus Kadesh. Because um, if you look, if you, that, that term new moon uh, in Hodesh, if you, if you, 
the Masoretic was written what, between like 500 and 700 AD. Uh, so if you go back to the Septuagint, which predates that by almost a thousand years, we're into the first, almost second century BC. Uh, and, and you look at the first mention of that, that term new moon as it's translated in, in the English, you find that in 1 Samuel. It goes to that uh, event actually of David and Saul. But if you take that same word that's used in the Septuagint, now let's go fast forward to the New Testament to Paul in Colossians. He uses it there. It's, uh, let's see, it's, uh, so the word is pneumonia. It's, it's a compound of, of nuos and men. So it means new month. Uh, the word men is, is month in Greek, and it's never, ever associated with the moon. The, uh, the word for moon in Greek is selene. Uh, so when you look at just just the difference between like the Septuagint and the Masoretic, uh, you have a massive difference there as well because the it's it's interesting to find you, you got to look at the history of where all this stuff comes from so we don't truly understand the text that we're working with the word the root word for Masoretic is Masora and it means a collection of traditions and so when you look at it from that perspective and and how those traditions have influenced the translators uh, now you kind of get to see the bigger picture of what we're dealing with. And so when they when they use that they translate that term Hodesh as new moon, I, I think that's a grave error, uh, and it's it's led to a great deal of uh, confusion amongst people when talking about you know the calendar in specific, uh, because they think it, it's tied in directly with the moon versus just being a renewing right. of the month. Yep. If you go to slide 28, Matt, that's the uh, the slide I was Sorry, talking I didn't about, mean, I believe. Didn't mean no, that was that was good. That's it plays into it. So, um, so this is what people are talking about in in Jubilee 6:23 through 2029, the new moon of the first month, and of the fourth month, and of the seventh month, and of the tenth month, and. So people will, will actually observe those new moons, even though they're keeping this calendar, they'll look for the sliver moon and then they'll observe that as a special day. <clears throat> but really, this is it, it, it means Hodesh, like Matt just explained. It means it, it's a renewal or the first day of the next month, basically. And so on the first day, if, if, you, if you do the new moons, okay, if you actually do the new moons, they won't line up with any of the things that happened. If you So if you go to the next slide, Matt, um, we can actually see um, in Numbers 10, on the first day of your months, you shall blow the trumpets over your offerings. That's the word Hodesh. And then if you want to go to the next one. Um, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> So, came about in the 601st year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, the water was dried up from the earth. So, Jubilees tells us that this is what happened in Genesis 8.13. So, that's the new moon. And Genesis tells us it's the first day of the first month, the Hodesh. So, it's actually, I mean, all you got to do is put the two together. If, so, obviously, the people that are... are doing this already are, are considering jubilees to be something they they believe and trust and all you got to do is go look at the dates it's mentioning in genesis and it tells you they're on the first day of the month not on the new moons so it, i mean it's just simple a lot of things happen on the first day of the months in, in many cases especially the ones that are called out in particular uh, days of remembrance it's the day yep. that Yah remembered, right? Yep. It's the day Yah remembered yep. Noah. It's the day, uh -huh. you know. And, and it's it's kind of tied yeah, into. Yeah, and if you go back. To, uh -huh. Yeah, I was gonna say if you go, go back, back to Jubilee six. Yeah, go back to Jubilee six. It tells you in that passage. Um, so I think it's the next one. It tells you what happened each of those four days, in Jubilees. Right. So if you could zoom in on six, uh, it's the one twenty twenty three through twenty nine. I think it's the next one. Down. Up or down. There you go. Down, down. Yeah, there it is. So if you can zoom in, I don't know if you can, the way we set this up, but on the, um, 
It says, Noah ordained them as feasts for the generations forever. And then it tells you the four things that happened on each of those four days. I'm going to let you finish because I can't quite read it at the size it is. Are you able to enlarge the font uh, there? See here. Yeah. I don't know if I can get it. Oh, no. well, here we go. I can, I can read it now. So, um, yeah, there we go. So it says uh, on the new month, it says new moon in this text, but it's the Hodash of the first month. He was bidden to make for himself an ark. So that's what happened. And then on that day, the earth became dry and he opened the ark and saw the earth. And on the new month or the Hodash of the fourth month, the mouths of the depths of the abyss were closed. And on the first day of the seventh month, all the mouths of the abysses of the earth were opened and the waters began to descend into them. And on the new, the first day of the tenth month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So that's how it should read. Because the problem is, is Jubilee 6 actually several times contradicts itself the way it's written in English. Because later in the chapter, it says, if you follow the motions of the moon, you'll be off from the start of the year by ten days. But then it says, then it calls all the months new months, or new moons. And it, and it says that you have to keep the new moons... So it doesn't even make sense. But that's because translator bias has translated Hodesh as new moon in some places, not everywhere. Yeah, in the most context, it should be, it makes sense as month, especially in Leviticus 23. Right. Yep. Absolutely. And, and many other places in the canon. <laughs> right. Well, the interesting thing is, is all the times where they use the word new moon or the words new moon, it's all around the feast days. All the other times when it's talking about months, it says, uh, or when it uses the word hodash, it just says month or first of the, the month or whatever of the month. But when they go out, get around the feast, when they know the people are going to be looking at the text to see how to keep the, the feast days, then they translate it as new moon. It's only, it's only translated uh, 20 times as new moon. And it's all around the feast days. 254 times it's translated as month. So <laughs> that's that's where the tradition comes in. I mean, There's a bias with that. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So yep. do y'all wanna do y'all wanna transition and touch on intercalation a little bit? Sure. You wanna talk about the four intercalary days first? <laughs> yeah. So that goes back to what kind of yep. ties directly into what we were just talking about with Jubilee Six. <laughs> Uh, those four intercalary days actually precede um, the first day of the month uh, or the day of the, the, the new moon, those days of observation or the days of remembrance. Uh, yep. Those are markers for the, the four seasons. And I, I think in your PowerPoint, um, I can get up. Yeah, it's in, it's in there somewhere. I don't remember where, but. Here we go. I got it. Yeah, zoom out. There you go. Let's see here. Yeah, so this would be one of the intercalary days mark in the spring. And then, you know, summer, fall, and then winter. Yeah, I and like then, to refer to them as a seasonal change day. Right. And when uh, when you look at it, so the way that we have been intercalating the calendar, um, it keeps the actual you know, solar alignments very, very close to those intercalary days on the Zadok calendar. Um, let's see, Enoch 82.4 touches on that. It says, blessed are the righteous and blessed are those that walk in the way of righteousness and sin not as the sinners in the reckoning of all their days in which the sun traverses the heavens. So actually not keeping the calendar as it's laid out uh, here is referencing as a sin. Uh, moving on, it says, entering into and departing from the portals for 30 days, and then the heads of the thousands of the orders of the stars, together with the four which are intercalated, which divide the four portions of the year, which leave them and enter them, enter with them four days. Uh, so this is the, and then I think in, in pre verses right after that, he actually names the angels that conduct those four days. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, he says one. And if you, is if you go to Enoch, good. 
I was just going to say, if you go to Enoch uh, 74, I believe it is, it tells us um, in Enoch 74, let me see, I'm going to double check my 75, sorry, 75, 1 through 3. It says, um, these are the leaders of the chiefs of the thousands, which are over all creation and over all the stars, with the four which are added and never separated from the place allotted them according to the complete calculation of the year. And these serve four days, which are not calculated in the calculation of the year. Respecting them, men greatly err, for these luminaries truly serve in the dwelling place of the world, one day in the first gate, one in the third gate, one in the fourth gate, and one in the sixth gate. And I don't know if we talked about gates. That's a really a more complicated topic that I think we would almost need to be screen sharing and showing. But anyways... The gates, um, well, I'll just explain it without explaining the gates because it's easier at this point. So basically, it's very confusing the way this is worded, and there are different translations of it. But it says, these serve four days, which are not calculated in the calculation of the year. Okay. Um, but then they are. But then <laughs> before it says, a complete calculation of the year. Okay. Right before that. So... What I personally believe, and I know I think Matt and I are on the same page on this, is that these what Enoch is telling us is these days we are not supposed to base the calendar off of the luminaries, like directly, not on that exact day that each of those events happen. And they actually don't happen exactly in perfect concert with a 364-day calendar. But what he's just telling us simply is, is that sign is supposed to happen. Each of those four signs are supposed to happen one day in each of those four months. So as long as our calendar lines up with that, then that I think that's what I believe, that's what he's telling us right here. And if we follow one of them or try to make all of them start our, our quarters, our seasons, then it will totally throw off the calendar. So um, I could be wrong, but that's what I believe. Right. Well, yeah, you have some that will realign the calendar in the fall and uh -huh. yeah, that completely throws you out for the rest of the year. Right. Yep. But, right. But yeah, there's I, people that are keeping this calendar that totally their calendar based on they'll they'll totally jump after the, the fall equinox comes in. They'll jump. They'll just skip days and start a new a new uh, count. And it yeah. totally throws a. a wrench into the whole perfect timing of the 364 day calendar well said so speaking of a, a wrench how do you figure out intercalation when the equinox falls on a wednesday because that's something that comes up sometimes so, you're going to share your spreadsheet now, Matt? Yeah, I'll try to explain it as best I can. Bring it out the big guns. All right. <laughs> it's got so, so much information in this document. It's crazy. All right. So, on a Wednesday. Okay, so we'll go to 2019 because that's when... That's when that alignment last happened. Uh, if I go you able to zoom in a little bit, Matt? Yep. Uh, hold on, let me see what, get what you got going over here. Yeah, it's hard to read it. Yep. All right, so right here, 2019. I, I have uh, set up some formulas to actually start, you know, flagging when certain events happen. So it's it's reading in dates from. Um, from another page actually no it's from this page so I, what i did is i went back and i know there's some aversion to time and date but it's really all that i have to work off of uh, i don't like micah I, I don't think that they're uh it's it's necessarily 100 percent, but it's close right uh so you have uh full moon new moon dates you have uh this uh the equinoxes is basically what i was really focusing on I did uh, go back and chart when the new moon set and when the full moon set, uh, the, their, their angular position on the horizon. 
So I got a lot of data input into this, and it goes back, uh, some of it goes back over 120 years. And uh, in 2019, we had the equinox land on the fourth day. We had uh, the equinox land on a full moon and a full moon also on the fourth day. So that was that was a big deal, and that's where a lot of wow. folks went ahead and took that as a sign that this is the perfect alignment we need to intercalate. The problem is, let's go back. And it, it seems to happen on the fourth day of the week uh, on a pretty regular basis. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, that's on that three. I think it's on a five and a six year pattern. And, and this is where uh, uh -huh. her name's Alicia. Uh, she was tied in with Jerry Morris. And that's where they were kind of intercalating on. So when, when they would get to a certain point, boom, and it would it would jump back or they would add a week. So some folks do that. I, I look at it as it's, again, it's just another one of those signs. And let me see if I can find what we're looking at. So here, Wednesday, 320, calculation methods. I think this will explain it a little bit better. It's not loading, sorry. There we go. Uh, all right, so this is the one, yeah, from Jerry Moore's Alicia. So 2019, they would have added a week. I don't, can you read that fine, or do yep. I need to zoom in a little more? Yeah, you zoom in a little bit, that'd be good. All right, so here, uh, intercalation method one, because uh, I was trying to uh, figure out, I was basically taking different folks' method and, and throwing them into a spreadsheet and trying to figure out, okay, how are these methods working? What's the math behind it? What are the alignments showing me? Um, and is it working? So 2019 would have been a year that uh, method one that I have it labeled here, they would have been intercalated. Uh, some folks I'm sure are familiar with John Mitten. He's had a Facebook page it's called Yaz Enoch Calendar. Um, I put all of his data in here as well. And he goes off of a, a three, five, and eight year pattern based on uh, a text there in Enoch where he talks about, you know, in three years, there's this many days, in five years, there's this many days, and in eight years, there's this many days. And he's been able to kind of figure out a pattern that worked there as far as intercalation method goes. And it happened to land on, um, on 2019 as well. Uh, what, what we did on 2019, uh, we didn't do anything. We didn't add a day because if we go back seven years or six years from there, we land on another date where that pattern that Micah pointed out uh, actually told us to intercalate. And then we also look at um, at the moon. Let's see here. Oh, here we go. Here. Moon set for sun 2019. So here, right here, 2019. Again, so what I'm highlighting here, if you can see that, that's that's the the sun's in the moon's location on on the horizon as it's setting according to Enoch. And then you have, if we intercalate, you have these patterns that are laid out in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, basically, it tells you, like in the year one, this is what what we have here, year one, two, three, year one, two, three. It's a little harder to explain. I know Mike has, you know, so we probably shouldn't go into it here because it is, it's it's kind of a little bit of a complicated thing. But when you start looking at that pattern, you can see that it, it starts to play out. And when we actually, I took back, let me scroll down here. So over 120 years following this intercalation method, the average year works out to 365.27 days, which keeps us nearly, I mean, it's perfectly in line with the sun. So it's to say, what do we do when, you know, the, the equinox lands on the fourth day? Um, you know, it just depends on what the other signs are telling us, I guess. So, so I got a question. question. Good. So are you against the method of adding a extra week as intercalation? 
on no. certain years? Uh, no, not at all. I mean, we, we okay. did, we added a week in 2020, right? Um, let's see, we added a week. Yeah. yeah, we added a week in 2020, and uh, according to the signs, we'll be adding another week in the year 2027. So this particular uh, pattern, actually, it's not just on a seven-year cycle. There's also intertwined in that a 28-year cycle um, that... Yep. lands and so when you have that additional intercalary year here's one of them in, in particular in 2029 it keeps things in perfect alignment and that's where you get the averaging of 365 so I, there there has to be some sort of correction otherwise i mean we all know we'll start to fall behind the seasons pretty rapidly yep, yep. right right want to and, that. and i just wanted to, i just wanted to say that couple things real quick one Matt I don't know um, it could be there might be something off in your just in the John Mitten section there because I'm I'm pretty familiar with this counter and I think they intercalated in 2022 to begin the year they, this year they, they, was their first uh, yeah they did yeah 2022 okay. okay so in 2020 maybe I misunderstood what you said but in 2020 they didn't intercalate they waited till 2022 so but Either way, I just wanted to say that in case he watches this video. Right. Okay. Yep. No, you're right. Because, yeah, I got um, 2016 and then 2022. Yeah. Yeah, I, I must have misspoke. But, yeah, you got to, uh, as you scroll up, so you got the, the three, the three, you know, eight. Right. So three and five are eight. So you have to look at it. You have to break it up into – in, in the different methods and there was i went through uh, a lot of that data and i mean that was a it was a hard one to really kind of get my head into because and i know if somebody grabs my spreadsheet they're going to have a really hard time getting into my head uh, <laughs> so i i did i, I asked him because there was a few, few things that weren't quite playing out in in some of the dates that he was giving me and um he said it had to do with with leap years in the Gregorian calendar. And that was basically the only way he explained it to me, but I still couldn't make it quite work. So there was, that's where I had some questions with it. It seems like a great start. And I think there's some uh, valid points to what he has presented. I don't want to disregard anything he's done. He's done a lot of work. He's had a lot of great information um, to go through. Hey Matt. I just, yes. I did want to just say real quick that before I forget, so in 2019, we had something interesting happen because the world, or I should say timeanddate.com and NASA, uh, said that the equinox happened on uh, the 20th, I believe. But a number of people, including myself, who tracked that, that year's equinox, is that correct? Yeah. yeah three, three so a number of people, including myself, who used... Um, different methods of sundials who track that equinox, we got it on the day before. Um, so and then some people got it on two days. It was almost like it was a two-day equinox, two-day straight line on the board. And um, so I believe, I still do believe that Enoch, when he says that we're supposed to start the year the day after the day of equal day and night, that's when it starts. I still believe that is true. That we're, we're we have to we have to at least start after the sign. We can't start before the sign, and that's where I differ from uh, like the Mittens method. Is they wait, they try to start as close to the sign as possible every year. But so some year, you know, sometimes they'll be as much as five days before the equinox when they start their calendar year. Whereas ours is, is, at least according to the way the lot fell, we were told to start after we saw the sign. Um, right. And so I just wanted to, to kind of throw that out there and clarify that. But at the same time, understanding all of that, we don't know why, for sure, why the lot fell that way when we cast lots or drew lots. Um, we're just trying to be obedient to what we were told. Um, but it doesn't mean that we understand all of this completely and our method is right. We're telling any of these guys who have 
have found different ways to do it that they're wrong. Right. Um, but one thing I, I will say, and I try to say this on every time I do a calendar show, because I, I think it's important. I feel like right now there's very few people who, who understand this calendar who are willing to admit that they don't, they can't absolutely without a doubt say this is how it works. Almost everyone, they find a method that seems like it makes sense and then they just say this is how it works and they preach it as truth. And they'll even block people out of groups and stop yeah. fellowship with people who have a different understanding. And um, I have all the same information that they have. So does Matt. So does a lot of other people. And I have I have personally called and talked with almost every single person that I've learned in, you know learned about their calendar, um, with the Zadok calendar, the the Dead Sea Scrolls Enoch calendar. I've talked with almost every one of them on the phone, or at very least, I've watched every one of their videos, so I made sure I understood what they said and read all of their literature. We all have the same information. I am not confident that any of those ways are absolutely true um, based on all that information. So I'm not willing to call that. Even the way we do it, I'm not willing to say this is absolutely the right way. Um, totally and I wish you. more people would, yeah, and I wish more people would just get on board with saying, look, this is what we're doing right now. This is what makes the most sense to us, but let's keep searching and instead of stopping searching and saying, we've got it figured out. Yeah. yeah. Well, when you're closed off to it, you'll never be, uh-huh. you're, you're pretty much unteachable when, when you're not willing to listen to other perspectives and, and other people's perspectives, yep. you, you just can't be taught. Yep. And, you know, I see things one way. Micah sees something a different way. You know, John sees things a different way. And I think there's, there's value in having different perspectives because yep. there's things that I miss. There's things that Mike is going to miss. And, and, you know, if, if I can't accept that, you know, I might be wrong on something because I'm not seeing it right, then I think that's a dangerous path to take. And, you know, I, yeah. I've i always kind of taken the position that said, I don't have to be right, but I want to be correct in what I'm doing. So I'm going to evaluate, you know, everything that I possibly can to make sure that it, it, it aligns up. And if I come across something that's contradictory to where I'm at, but it makes more sense, then why not give it a look? You know, you know, I don't totally agree. Yeah, I totally agree. You should do the best with what information you do have. And we should study to show ourselves approved with this topic and others and bounce ideas off others because iron sharpens iron and continue to steady, like Michael said. And and, and, and I have have, have a, a guy that I know, really neat brother that he believes that the equinox actually sets the year. So you, you see the equinox and the next day is the first day of the year. And then the fourth day after that is Shabbat, which means it wouldn't be, you know, Shabbat wouldn't be on Saturday or on the, the Saint, the Gregorian Saturday, every year it would be on a different day. If I find out, you know, I have, I'm visited by an angelic messenger or, uh, somehow I get information that that's the way I'll, I'll do it. You know, I'll do it. Like if I found out tonight, if somebody presented information, I would change the day I'm keeping Shabbat. You know, I have no issue with that. I just want to do what's right, but I'm not going to change something that big. If I don't, if Yah doesn't somehow give me clear direction to do so and then ask everybody else around me to do it just on a hunch. So yeah. it's about being righteous, not being right. Right. Yep. Yeah, the 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 methods that move the Sabbath every year, um, I, I do. I struggle with those because that was the first thing that was sanctified in Scripture was the seventh day, um, which a lot of people don't realize that mm-hmm. it's the first thing that he set apart. Uh, and yeah. you know, I, I and he's he says that I am Yah, I change not. So why would this keep changing? I, you, if you follow you know, the lunar Sabbath, you know. That, I mean, it's it's every month. You got a different Shabbat. Right. Um, right. I, I, you know, like, like Micah said, unless you got some really hard evidence um, that would point to that as being the way, I, I have a really hard time accepting that. But again, you know, I could be wrong. 
But you know, um, you know, as we're we're on the topic of intercalation, your next question there, right? Is there any other scriptural evidence? And I think that kind of goes into what we've been talking about here. No, there's not. Uh, you know, and so any method that's put forward is really just a it's the product of you know somebody's study or our study. You know, the walking it out, the things that we've observed. Um, you know, in my case, a lot of math behind it. There's, but there's really no hard evidence in, in scripture and in, in Jubilees and Enoch um, and in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They're silent. Uh, as far as I can tell, I, I have not found any other evidence to say otherwise. You look at the, if you map out the priestly courses, you know, and they seem to be unbroken. When, when you overlay the Dead Sea Scrolls with the, the lunar patterns and the priestly courses, we, you know, like we have four, four or so years of lunar data that lines up directly with the priestly courses. They're not broken. So we know with at least within that four year time span, they didn't add a week because, you know, you don't have that jump in, in, in the lunar alignments. So it's, it's really, really hard to say what exactly was done, if, if anything at all. But I, I do believe unless unless no, yeah, I just want uh -huh. you know unless he's taken things and moved it around to where you know actually things did shift in the heavens, it's there had to be some method to correct it. Right. Yeah. And and I just wanted to say you know if you read Jubilee six, uh, thirty two through. Um, 36 36 or 30 well really through the end of the chapter yeah um, but i have it here i can i could read it um it says command you the children of yasharal that they observe the years according to this reckoning 364 days and these will constitute a complete year and they will not disturb its time from its days and from its feasts for everything will fall out in them according to their testimony and they will not leave out any day nor disturb any feasts but if they do neglect and do not observe them according to his commandment, then they will disturb all their seasons, and the years will be dislodged from this order, and they will neglect their ordinances. And all the children of Yasharel will forget and will not find the path of the years, and will forget the new months and the seasons and the Sabbaths, and they will go wrong as to all the order of the years. For I know, and from henceforth will I declare it unto you, and it is not my own devising, for the suffer lies written before me, and on the heavenly tablets the division of days is ordained, lest they forget the feasts of the covenant and walk according to the feasts of the other nations after their error and after their ignorance. For there will be those who will assuredly make observations of the moon, how it disturbs the seasons and comes in from year to year ten days too soon. For this reason the years will come upon them, when they will disturb the order and make an abominable day the day of testimony, and an unclean day a feast day. And they will confound all the days, the holy with the unclean, and the unclean day with the holy. For they will go wrong as to the months and Sabbaths and feasts and jubilees. For this reason I command and testify to you that you may testify to them. For after your death your children will disturb them, so that they will not make the year 364 days only. And for this reason they will go wrong as to the new months and seasons and Sabbaths and feasts. And they will eat all kinds of blood and all kinds of flesh. So, like we talked about earlier, this isn't simple. It's not easy. We're not just going to figure it out. And actually, I, I really believe yeah. that the reason you find treasure when you seek is not because you seek harder than somebody else um, or you're a better researcher or more knowledgeable. It's, it's the heart. You really want to walk his way and do it yeah. his way. Then he'll show you the answer. And so I don't know when he's going to do that and clarify this. Yeah. But I do believe if we continue to seek with that heart, he will someday, eventually. It's yeah, I want to share something. Oh, go ahead, Matt. I was say it's probably going to be three days before, just like it happened. <laughs> right at the last minute. Right. You know? Yeah, yeah. So I just want to share. Give us you... information just a few days before. Yeah. So let me reread re part of what you just read in Jubilee okay. 6, 36. For there shall be those who shall... Assuredly, make observations of the moon. Now it disturbs the seasons and comes in from year to year, 10 days too soon. So 
So I did the Looney Solar Calendar for about 15 years. And every couple years, as y'all know, there's a 13th month. And I remember the leader of the congregation I used to attend. You say, all right, we're going in 13th month. And that, and so stuff has to make sense to me because there's a lot of stuff in the world that doesn't make sense, especially since 2020. But this ain't about that. Yep. So every time that happened, I was like, it, it really troubled me in my spirit because it didn't make sense. I didn't see the 13th month anywhere in scripture. And then Abba peeled the veil back and he's like, okay, son, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to allow you to read Jubilees now. And I read Jubilee 6 and I was like, oh, and then like a huge light bulb went on because he helped me to understand yep. why, we, why we had that problem with that calendar. And then another thing that troubled my spirit is every, every now and then, because the so with the Zadok calendar, it's it's calculated to the 364 days. But Looney Looney Solar, it has to do with the moon and the sun. Moon especially controls the months with that calendar. And every every few years on Sabbath, a Passover will fall, and I, and that troubled my spirit too. Because I'm I'm like, okay, so which command do we hold in higher esteem here? Are we going to rest on Sabbath? Or are we going to do all this work that is required for a real scriptural Passover because there's some work involved. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if y'all want to touch on that and maybe some other issues or whatever with the Looney Solar calendar that does, I think the Zadok calendar kind of takes care of. Yeah, the, the Looney Solar calendar, that was uh, um, one, our first year keeping that calendar, we were we celebrated or observed um, Yom Kippur on a Shabbat, which, you know, it was kind of a real, you know, another weird one. Like, how do you do that? How do you do both on the same day? It's just strange. So yep. it, make, it makes so much more sense. <laughs> every um, yeah. Right. Yeah, that's where. This doesn't know, work. No, and, and that's where the Zadok, you know, it. it or, or the, the Dead Sea Scroll calendar, however, whatever you want to call it, it, it keeps all of that separate and unique and orderly. And when, when you're following the moon, you know, like we talked, it goes all over the place. I mean, it, it traverses back and forth, and it does, it falls behind 10 days every year. So every three years, you have to add a month or a second eight hours, they call it, to keep things in line. And it's, it's confusing. I, I I remember when we first came into this walk, I mean, I was convinced it had to be tied directly to the moon because you could walk out, look up, and, oh, I'm halfway through the month or I'm at the beginning of the month. And, you know, my early mind was like, okay, well, the, the Bedouins or the sheep herders, they're going to be out in the field, and, and that's what they got to tell them. But, you know, going back to that comment that Zach made about it, not being about following the sun or the moon, but being about obedience, um, Yep. You know, that that's really, to me, that's the heart of it. I mean, you look all through Scripture, what's it about? It's about obedience. When he's chastising Israel, it's about, hey, your guys aren't being obedient. So we need to, you know, it's all about getting back to where we're approaching him the way that he's commanded us to approach him. Where we're, we're keeping the feast dates the way that he's commanded us to keep them. Um, it's, it's all about walking that path of obedience. And I mean... We can get sidetracked on all of these things, and he even warns the people of Israel about following after the moon and, and being prone to bow down and worship them. I'm not accusing yep. anybody of that's keeping the, the solely lunar calendar of worshiping the moon, but there's that tendency in, in human nature to, you know, to look to these things as as, as something that they're not. Yep. I did so want to just say something real quick, guys, before I forget. Um, the, I wanted to, this isn't about any of the questions or related to any of the questions, but just real quick. Um, a lot of people seem to get confused over which calendar is which, and I think some of them think that if, if you say you keep the Zadok calendar, that you're not keeping Enoch and you're not keeping a scriptural calendar. And um, I chose personally to call it the Zadok calendar when I um, – interact with people only because a lot of people don't consider Enoch to be scripture. A lot of people don't know yeah. or struggle with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And Zadok is one of, so he is, he was the high priest during the time of David who um, helped David select 
the 24 courses. He was not one of the 24 courses. He was above. He was the high priest. Those 24 courses, each of those families served in the temple one week and then the next one the next week. But he was the high priest above all of them. And um, and in Ezekiel 44 and 48, it tells us that his line, his family, were the only ones who didn't go astray when everyone else in Israel went astray. And, and they are then promised the eternal priesthood as a result of that. So I, I personally choose to call it that just based on that because I want to tie it to something that I can re relate to people in Scripture that they understand and they know about and show them. But it's, it's exactly the same calendar as in Enoch, and it's exactly the same calendar as what's in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's, it's the same. There's different ways of using those texts to come up with the calendar. They're all similar other than the, day, the start of the year. But there's different ways of starting the year, but, but it's the same basic calendar. So just wanted and to clarify that. I, I think it's important, too, to point out that the, the priestly courses are incredibly important when we're looking at the calendar. Um, you know, when, when you overlay them as they're put out in the Dead Sea Scrolls over the certain dates, we're able to establish a pattern. And when we talk about patterns, uh, you look at the tabernacle, okay? And the tabernacle is a pattern of a heavenly thing here on earth. Yep. And those 24 horses, I believe, are what we see in Revelation with the 24 elders that sit before the throne of God. It's, it's a pattern. It's the same thing being yep. portrayed in, a, in an earthly manner. And so it's not it's not that those 24 elders are like, you know, disciples. Or I think that there are actually beings that are already there and have been there for a long time. And, and these courses that are yep. set forth into the administration of the earthly tabernacle are a picture of that. And so yep. it's and that's where like a lot of these other calendars just don't sync with that priestly courses, you know, uh, with the Mishmarat. They just they right. completely disregard it. That's, that's a, a really, good point. That's a really good point, Matt. Yeah, I, I, that, I'm glad you brought that up because that is one of the reasons our calendar starts the way it does is, is we are trying to sync up with, with the moon, which is also, according to the Dead Sea Scrolls and Enoch, or the Dead Sea Scrolls, is synced up with the priestly courses, um, at least for periods of time. So we're trying to sync up with all those things and not just go with one one thing. So. Right, I got a question in the that was in the chat earlier. If y'all want to address this one, this uh, this is a really good question, I think. So Katie said, "My question is, how are we so, so certain that with the calendar changes that the seven day cycle wasn't changed or interrupted since the beginning of time?" Matt, you want to uh, pull that that PowerPoint back up and go to the bottom? Sure. I've got. I think like six or seven slides, I believe, at the bottom of passages that say that the calendar, that time and calendar will never change. This this is, I mean, I, I questioned the same thing. Um, and what I did is I started looking in scripture and I think it's all the way near the bottom, yeah. Um, I started questioning, you know, looking in scripture, trying to find answers as, has it ever changed? And you can see from both Enoch and Canon. I don't know if I, I found one in Jubilee specifically, but um, the whole account of them according to every year of the world forever until a new work shall be effected, which will be eternal. You know, nothing changes, he says. It's all perfect and in order. And earlier in Jubilees, it did say in Jubilee 6, it says that it's written on the heavenly tablets. Time is written on the heavenly tablets, you know. We know that our Elohim is not not an Elohim who changes. Oh man! You know he stays the same. So, um, and and if you keep scrolling down through those, we don't, we don't have to read them all. But I mean, there's just a bunch the of last, passages. Oh yeah, here we go. Oh, that was yeah, the last yeah. one. Okay, so yeah. So, Genesis yeah, eight twenty two. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest and never changed. You know, um, yeah. and I think I took a bunch of them out, actually. I only left a couple in here. But, um, yeah, here's one from Jeremiah that talks about Israel will cease from being a nation before him if time ever changes. And um, so 
I don't know. I, I struggle with that concept personally. And one of the, you know, one of the main times when people say that time change would be Joshua's long day. And and Matt touched on this earlier. Matt's got some some technical reasons that he can share as to why he doesn't believe that. But just a simple, you know, thought from me is it makes no sense why he would bring them into the land and tell them to keep this calendar and all the feasts and mess it up right before he, he brings them into the land. I, I just, I just can't get on board with that concept. Um, uh, if you look you at have, it, do you have any thoughts uh, on that? A, yeah. I mean, if you look at it as a giant heavenly watch, when I pull the dial out of my watch and I wind it back, both hands move. Uh, you know, Joshua said yeah. the sun and moon stand still. You know, they, they the, the items that are controlling the time and the calendar, both of them stop. Uh, you know, so the same argument can be made, you know, like when Hezekiah had, you know, the sun move backward. Um, right. The moon very well could have too. Uh, I, I don't think that those things. And the stars. And, and the stars, yeah. I, I think I think everything, the whole thing, the whole watch got wound back. Um a little bit to make that adjustment and i mean then you can have the argument okay well you know time itself didn't change but what about observation right uh i get a lot of a lot of pushback as far as like people you know we've talked about the gregorian a little bit uh, people don't like the gregorian when they're starting to look into the calendars because of its connection to pagan things but it goes back to i don't know what fifth century a.d when it was Put in place to make up for a, an intercalation issue with the, the Julian calendar, and all they did was add ten days to the calendar. So let's just say a Tuesday the second became Tuesday the twelfth. It was still Tuesday. They didn't change the weekly cycle between the Julian and the Gregorian. And there's actually some monastic groups over in uh, the Far East or or like uh, Eastern Europe that still keep the Julian calendar today. Uh, but the Julian calendar was in place first, second century BC. Uh, and that was the primary calendar of the Roman Empire, which just so happened to rule over Judea during that time. And it's also the same calendar that was in place at the time when the Dead Sea Scrolls were written. And uh, again, the, the predominant force that controlled the vast majority of, of trade and commerce throughout that region followed that calendar and so just going back from the last 2000 years we know that the sabbath hasn't shifted i i, I know i get the argument that well there was some some governments that instituted a, an eight or a 10 day week but look at what happened shortly after the people it didn't, last. Just, it didn't last yeah it, it always reverted back and, and that goes back to my statement earlier where the Sabbath was the first thing that was sanctified in Scripture, and I firmly believe that it has some divine protection over it, and um, that it hasn't changed. And, you know, it's just you see it play out through. And I and I think. Good. I was just going to say I think that um, you know a lot of people miss something with the Sabbath changing, because the enemy. He is the accuser. He wants to be able to pin people down to something they knew and didn't do so he can bring that accusation before them on judgment day. Yeah. And if every like if he were to change the Sabbath to a different day, that is the sign of the covenant. It's the mark. Right. It's it's called. So if he were to change that day, he can't bring that accusation now because nobody knows when it really is. But it, but if he left it the same and just twisted mm. everything around it up and made it confusing, mm. now he can say every one of those people, they knew that the seventh day when it was, just like the Roman Catholic Church says, that right. we, with our authority, changed the Sabbath. If you believe the scriptures and you think you're keeping it uh, because the scriptures say it, you aren't. You're actually keeping our instruction to do it. So I believe he wants people to break, knowingly break Shabbat every single week. That's a good point. Uh, so I, I will try to say this next thing is in as, as much love and humility as I can. So I did a, uh, it's probably three months ago, I did a video on why 
my family doesn't do the lunar Sabbath. And I, I, me- I can't remember how many points that I made and I went, I went through and I showed scripture from my perspective. But one of them was the, the never ending seven day weekly cycle because that doesn't exist in a lunar Sabbath observation or however you want to word it. And people in the comments will say, will try to refute that. I'm like, it started in Genesis. There's nowhere in scripture that indicates it ever ended because we serve an Elohim. That's not of confusion. So that's confusion. If he, if he had a creation week that pointed to Sabbath, the seventh day, and he rested, the Messiah rested. And then later on, he, he takes that away. So that that's confusion. So that, that doesn't make sense to me. Yep. It makes sense to me that there is a continuous yeah. seven day weekly cycle. Yep. Yep. And, you know, I think that, um, you know, this kind of ties in with the, the uh, one of the other questions you have about the 360 day calendar. But the, the other one that people use the most, there's three of them that are the main ones is Joshua, Hezekiah, and then the flood. Yep. But the flood one is super easy. I mean, if you believe the book of Enoch, Enoch tells you pre flood that the sun and moon are on different paths because the 360 day calendar people, they push the concept that um, the sun, moon and stars were all in the same cycle and then something got messed up and there's different versions of beliefs on it. But um, Enoch literally tells you they're on a different cycle from from, you know, before the flood. So I don't know. And all the people that believe that, that I've come across, they all uh, consider Enoch scripture. So I just don't know how, how you can justify that. I mean, there's no way around it. it the, it's math. Like, <laughs> like Matt said, you can't get around, you can't get around math. It just, it only works one way. Yep. So, um, and, and that also encompasses the other question about, um, you know, how do people justify who keep a, a lunar only or a lunar based lunar solar or whatever based calendar, but yet believe that Enoch and Jubilees are, are scripture? How do you justify it? And there's only one way that I can find because I have tried to make it work. Believe me, because I was keeping that, you know, the, the lunar solar calendar before I found this. And somebody showed me Enoch, and I was like, "That's got to be corrupted because it's not how it works." That was my first response. I, you know, but cognitive dissonance. It, it doesn't. <laughs> what's that? Yeah, exactly. But um, the only way, but I, but yet I liked the Book of Enoch, and I was intrigued by it, and so I was like, "Well, maybe just that part is corrupt," or I don't know. I was coming up with all these things, but if you believe that book is real, is legit. You can't just you can't go and read two chapters in the luminary section that talk about the moon and ignore the other eight chapters of the, the luminary <laughs> yeah. section that clearly in context say context say that it's a 364 day year and the moon is 354 days. So I don't know how you do that. I, yeah. I don't know. And with it being a pre flood, you know, text that takes you back to this is how it was made at creation because there was no other event between creation and the flood so there couldn't have been any changes between those two points and i think that's actually like question 19 on your list there Uh, the sun and moon stars have the same number of days in the beginning my hour hand and minute hand don't have the same ratio on my watch if the sun and the moon always moved in the same pattern to each other you would never have phases of the moon that would always be constant so those things i, I think yeah. you know the different ratio between those two heavenly bodies was definitely in place from the beginning because they serve a purpose yeah yeah and somebody in the chat said this yeah. is a good comment yeah. we were talking about earlier changing is not easy but when the set apart spirit leads you you change so that's what you're talking about earlier a few times Amen. micah Amen. yep yeah absolutely for sure so i don't know if y'all want to transition to have a couple oh you got something micah you want to share uh no no i'm good 
I'm good. I did, but then I forgot it. So I'm good. <laughs> it'll it'll come back. It'll come back. I'm rubbing off on you. It might. <laughs> so if you want to transition into, I have a couple of pretty much objections for the Zadar calendar. See, let's see y'all's best response. So what? What would be y'all's response when Psalms 104, 19 comes up when discussing the calendar? Should we read that? Real Matt quick? brought that up so, earlier. Yeah. Yeah. If you, let me see. I can. I mean, so, let's read it real quick. 4, 19 says that. Yeah, go for it. Just so it quoted perfectly. <laughs> He made the moon for appointed times. The sun knows it's going down. Yep. So basically, if you read Enoch, Matt t- touched on this earlier, Enoch 75.4 says, on stated months, it changes settings. And on stated months, it makes its progress on each. And two, the moon sets with the sun. In those two gates which are in the midst in the third and fourth gate so those two passages go together they fit like a glove the moon the sun knows the place of the moon's setting and it is for appointed times it is for moedim if we didn't have that witness and matt matt really laid it out earlier i don't know if everybody understood it and maybe maybe i'll take a stab at it quick but basically what he found is is the moon uh sets in almost the exact same place as the sun on the horizon at the spring spring. equinox to to give you that only in the spring so i I can't pull this up i believe that what i want to show you guys this i can't pull it up on my screen because i don't have i don't know if it's going to show i don't let me make you full screen brother see see yeah i don't know if it actually uh it's just gonna be white anyway If if you go in closer man yeah, just hold it closer and it'll focus. Pull it back a little bit. Turn it and then turn it sideways just slightly. Turn it sideways just slightly and it starts to show up. Uh, a little uh, more. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's it's out of the way. Yeah. Anyway, uh, if you look at uh, you if you look at <laughs> the, the ancient Hebrew for the word that's used there for seasons, okay? It uh it's a pictograph. If any of you are familiar with ancient Hebrew. So the first one is an eye. Uh, it's, a, it's a picture of an eye. And the second Hebrew word there is it's a picture of a door. So, Dalit. Uh, it, Dalit. Yeah. And, and so that word actually means witness uh, in, in the ancient Hebrew. So it's, yep. it's translated as seasons in our English, but the moon is appointed as a witness. Uh, and, and when you combine those two pictographs, it actually means a door, which is really interesting because we're now we're talking about gates again. Uh, so when the moon is being a witness as the sun progresses through these gates and then the sun knows it's going down through these gates, we're, again, it points right back to the beginning of the year when we're talking about how do we begin a year. So it, it's, again, it, it goes, there's a lot that's lost in translation, literally, uh, when we're looking at these topics, we have to look at different sources and not just, you know, our Masoretic text or not just the Septuagint, but let's dig into the ancient Hebrew and, and, and see some of these yep. different parallels that are coming out. Just, I mean, that's that's way different than what I read in my, my King James or the ESV. <laughs> you know, it, it makes it way more relevant yep. because, you know, now the moon is actually a witness. And I, uh, there's another one psalm. I, can't remember but it, it calls the moon a faithful witness and um so it's it's starting to tie those two 80, thoughts 7, together yeah 8, 81 3 or 81 7 or something like that yeah, yeah something like that yeah i think it's 81 yeah 3. i yeah the the uh other thing that's interesting that word moedim is used or moed or i think it's moedim is used many times to refer to the tent of meeting and some some translations call it the tent of witness. So, yeah. Let's try that. You can actually see it. I think with the. With hey, the he's got it. He's there put the go. black on there. Yeah, there it's we go. A little out of focus, but you can see. So you got the eye, right? It's the eye. And, and then the that represents a door, but the word means witness. 
in the ancient Hebrew right here. Man, too bad my wife's not on here because she loves the Odeot. Or the ancient pictographic Hebrew. That was cool that you brought that up. Yep. She, I'm going to have to make her watch this now. <laughs> Let's see. What's the next one? Oh, this is a good one. What about Sirach 43, 6 through 8? So that one's similar. So let me read. I'll, I'll, I got that. I'll grab. Let me okay, read it real ahead. quick. Now I'll let you address that with Micah. Right. Just for quick reference. So Sirach 43, 6 through 8. He made the moon also to serve in its season. There's that word again. For appointed times and a sign for the world or a witness. From the moon is the sign of feast and a light that decreases in its completion. The new moon is called after its name, increasingly wondrously in its changing, being an instrument for the host above, shining in the expanse of the Shamaim. That'd be the firmament. So that one's that one's similar to Psalms 104.19. But that's another one that people will point to. What about that one? I think so, it's the same thing. There's, there's no way. Yeah, it could be very well be the same thing. But if it's not, um, the other, the other issue is it'd be the only witness yep. against right. or for the moon being used for the feast. It would be the only one. And second of all, this is just me, Matt. You may, you may even disagree with me on this, but I personally don't consider all of the apocryphal books to be scripture okay you know like for instance the maccabees i know matt and i are on the same page about those books we do not consider them to be scripture um and sirach is one like it says in one place that you shouldn't help a sinner in sirach um there's just some you things should, that um that yeah. I'm, I'm yeah exactly there's some things i'm uncomfortable with with that book I'm not saying yep. it's not something that's it's good to read and glean what you can from it, but I don't think it's scripture. And I certainly don't think it should be taken into consideration for how we set our calendar when it's especially when it's the only witness. So that's just my opinion, but um, for whatever it's worth. <laughs> I agree. Uh, the, the multiple witness thing is to me, it's important as well. And that's where, when we look at the pattern that's laid out in the Zadok calendar or in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and then we can go back through the Old Testament, you know, starting in First Samuel and, and, and pull out dates, like I mentioned earlier, that establish a Shabbat and overlay that with the Zadok calendar. You're spanning hundreds, if not a thousand years easily, and those dates line up, boom, 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 boom. And you can't do that on on a solely lunar calendar. You can't do that on a lunar Sabbath calendar. There's no other calendar that will do that because it doesn't fit those patterns. And, you know, yeah. is it a wild coincidence? You know, once, maybe twice, that would be a coincidence. But when you got multitude, you know, a, a dozen or better um, references that are pointing to a Sabbath and actually calling out what day of the week or, or month it was, rather, um, and that laying over top perfectly on the Zadok calendar, I don't think it's a coincidence. I think it was evidence that that's what they were using at that time. Yeah, if you see a bunch of different yeah. examples all over the place, you better pay attention. Right. <laughs> yeah, once is an anomaly, twice is a coincidence, three times you got something worth looking at for sure. Yep. Yep. And a lot of people uh, on the 360 only calendar, they bring up all the prophecies. But if you if you go back to Enoch, where we just read about how people err and how they use the calendar in prophecy, I think it's possible that sometimes Yah doesn't he's not he's not speaking of a 364 day year. He's talking about the 360 days. So sometimes in prophecy, when it's divisible by 360, that's the reason why, because prophetically, those days don't count in the calendar. So and it literally tells you that right in Enoch. Yeah, so, it does. You know. It can be confusing to people, but um, but the flood account is another one people use a lot to try to mm -hmm. say that it was only 360 days because it would seem as though the ark rested um, on the 300 and 
60th day based on the math. But if you if you actually lay this out, um, they tie it to the 17th of the month. Um, but the ark could have rested after 150 days just as easily as if it rested on the 150th day. Okay. Mm -hmm. And there are only two more days in that time period on a 364-day calendar so, uh, than what they're on a 360-day calendar. So the, 50, the 150th day on a 360-day calendar is the, and I'm pulling from my notes, sorry guys, over on the side here, but uh, is the 17th of the seventh month, meaning you have already passed the 17th when the ark rested, if it rested after the 150 days. Whereas on a 364-day calendar, the waters receded after the 150th day, which is the 16th day of the seventh month, and then the ark rests on the next day, which is the 17th. So, um, it's just about how you read the English, English Hebrew, you know. Uh, if, if he Hebrewish. And trying to, <laughs> yeah, Hebrew. If you're trying to fit it into your 360-day calendar, you can make it fit that way, but it could fit either way. So yeah. um, to say that, and, and almost all the people that are 360 only, many, many of them are, are Enoch people, but yet it says 364 all over the place in that oh. book. So like, what are you talking about? It doesn't make any sense at all. And if you, if you chart out what I just said with my mouth, I wish I could share this slide. I thought it was in that thing that I sent. Uh, sent you Matt, but it's not. I have it here in another PowerPoint. So frustrating. But I charted them out next to each other on a calendar, and it, it just makes so much more sense that it's maybe, after 150 days, not maybe if you hold the 50th day. Maybe if you hold the other computer screen up to the the screen you're we're watching you, and then I can make you full <laughs> screen. I, I will say, um, I, I may be completely off base with this, but when you look at Daniel and the dates that are given there and if you look at that being a prophecy uh going back to yeshua's time with you know the the end of the sacrifice and the destruction of the temple um you had you had them offering a period and defiling the um the right. temple like right around the was it the first day of Sukkot, which actually ties in with a, a roman um, festival where they would offer to jupiter and so the timing there works out perfectly and if you add i think it's 1290 days or whatever it winds you up uh right about i think right at the end of unleavened bread and then you add in the additional days to make up the final part uh, blessed are those that come to the 1335th day i don't remember right offhand you land on shop it's uh -huh. it happens pretty quickly there so if, if um just going off of that you know from sukkot to end up unleavened bread, to shabbat wool, those numbers pretty well line up. It's not exact, um, yep. but you know, it's it's fairly interesting. And there's there's some correlation there that I think I need I need to study out a little bit more. Yeah, yep. And one other thing too on the uh, on the the flood that I found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the writers of the scrolls who refer to themselves as the sons of Zadok. They said that the flood, or the, the, that the year was exactly 364 days in the flood account. So, or whatever that's worth, what, you know, if you hold any stock or put any stock in what they write, um, I personally do. And I, I don't think it's an accident that they, it's almost like they're clarifying it because it's a little unclear in Genesis. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, let me make a, a comment since we've been talking about as they refer to them as non-canonical books or extra biblical. So uh, let me find it. So Christy said, I agree, Micah. This is from something you said earlier. We do need to use care when we read the extra quote non-canonical end quote to test them out to see their validity. So I would say that you shouldn't even touch those books if you don't already have a solid foundation of understanding Torah. The rest of the canon, yes, mm -hmm. but you need to, the solid foundation for all of Scripture is Torah. If you don't know Torah, 
you don't need to even be reading the book of Enoch or Jubilees, to be honest, because you, you can't test those all these other books if you don't know the foundation. So I just want to say that, and we probably should have said this at the beginning of the show, but it's all good. I, yeah, I think, I, it's I think that argument could be said about reading Galatians even. Right? If you don't understand yep. Torah, that too. then you know you, you, you don't understand the basis in which those writings were pulled from. And so you're, you know, you don't have that foundation that's set forth in the scripture to pull, you know, to, to keep you stable and, yep. and, you know, keep you from falling away. So you have the discernment. So when something comes up that doesn't quite line up with Torah, you can say, okay, is this right? Or am I understanding it incorrectly? And, you know, exactly. I think you need to understand Torah first. Yep. Uh, I mean, so somebody asked in the chat, like about your PowerPoint. If you could email that to me so I can get that out to people, that'd be good. Somebody's asking in the chat sure. about it. I can do that. So here's here's a fun question. What about the thirteenth month in Ezekiel? Because that one is a big objection for the Looney Solar camp, I guess you could say. <laughs> it's weird just before this I hadn't heard of that one. <laughs> I've heard it quite a bit. And there's only one, it's again, it's only one witness, it's the only one they can pull um, as a, a possibility. And if you read that account carefully, you'll see in um, Ezekiel chapter one that he's in one Jubilee. So it says um, in Ezekiel one, now it came about in the 30th year. On the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was by the river Hebar among the exiles, the heavens opened and I saw visions of Elohim. And it came about in the sixth year, on the fifth day of the sixth month, as I was sitting, uh, oh, I, I, sk I skipped into eight. Anyways, so it's the 30th year of a jubilee uh, in, in Ezekiel 1, 1, okay? Then if you jump to... Ezekiel 8 1 where people now see that Ezekiel's sitting up after he's laying on his side for the 430 days as he was instructed yep. to do he's now sitting up they say but if you read the text it says it came about in the sixth year that's referring to the Jubilee cycle I believe on the fifth day of the sixth month I was sitting in my house with the elders this is this is like a long time after the 30th year out of a 49 year Jubilee cycle potentially or it could have been referring to the sixth year of a seven-year cycle, possibly. But even still, it would be like three years later. Um, people do like to say that uh, it's referring to the to the number of years of exile, which it says uh, down in verse 2 of chapter 1, it talks about the exile. But it specifically says that that's referring to the years of the exile in that verse, and it doesn't say that in chapter 8. So... I mean, you can you can try to eke out one witness to a 13th month being included. They're trying to say that the 430 days um, wouldn't be possible on a 364-day calendar. It would only be possible if a 30th month was added. And and they are they are right if they, if you ignore the jubilees uh, being thrown in there, the jubilee years. But again, it's only one witness. So either way, I just can't. I can't go there personally. I don't know if you have anything, Matt. It just. I mean, you go from chapter eight talking about the sixth year, and I agree with you. I think that's the sixth year of the Shmita cycle, and then you go back to one one, and it's talking about the thirteenth year. You don't count backward anyway. Yeah. So I. I yeah, I just don't see how we can really make that work out. Yep. Yeah, I've even like... talked to some good brothers who still are keeping the solar calendar that they agree with me. I've asked them, I'm like, look, I'm, I'm trying to be objective here. Do you think that this is proving that there was a 13th month? And they're like, no, <laughs> it's not. You can't use that to prove a 13th month. Yeah, that's saw somebody try to explain that, that I think it keeps the lunar Sabbath maybe. And it was it, the way they explained it, it was very confusing to me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it makes a lot more sense if they're starting out. So, yeah, in the 13th year, 
of the exile or of like in some cases it'll say like the reign of Darius or whatever. Uh, so you have that marker, but because we don't have a thirteenth year unless you are combining shemitas, right? And then yeah, Ezekiel eight. It came about in the sixth year on the fifth day of the sixth month because there he actually gets. No, no. I just don't see how that makes it work. How it makes it work. All right, yeah. so if y'all if y'all are interested, let's get to some meaty stuff. So th this is a question from a local brother. He asked, "Where are we in regards to the year seven thousand and its relation to the hundred twentieth jubilee?" Do oh, <laughs> All right, let's see a PowerPoint or not a PowerPoint Excel spreadsheet. I know it's coming. <laughs> yeah, let me pull this up because. Um, engineer brain rolling no i will right. so you know, there's a disclaimer this could be wrong do your own research <laughs> yeah all this all this section everybody's gonna be food for thought but it's it's interesting to discuss and think right. about hide that there we go yep all right so this is uh if if any of you guys have studied kind of uh, the priestly courses this is a basically a condensed version of the priestly courses because if you expand this out it um uh, it's really hard it looks like this okay so basically what we have is uh the numbers are are in relation to a priestly course like 22 is the mole 10 is check and the reason why those are highlighted is because those are the prominent ones that are highlighted in the dead sea scrolls and uh so what i did here is i took the priestly courses and i took basically some historical events that that highlight a sabbath um i went back so sabbatical years so now we're talking about josephus in, in many cases i know there's some questions surrounding josephus and its validity but uh it's really well we have to go on in, in some cases so there's at least three uh here that i i been able to pinpoint as a, a sabbath in in the antiquities of the jews and uh, and then there's some other references. So we know Herod died in 4 BC. He was uh, he died right, uh, yeah, three days before the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So that's that's a documented historical fact. Uh, 2 BC, uh, Herod's son Philip, you know, he started construction of uh, Caesarea Philippi. So we can start taking some of these events and laying them over. I got some that come from Cedar Alam and some other um, rabbis that are pinpointing, you know, like here, 69 CE or common era, the destruction of the temple. So we know that that happened after a sabbatical year. So when we lay that into the priestly courses and, you know, we get those highlighted, you know, sure enough, on the, on the Jubilee cycle, they do land on a Shemitah year. If we line up one, the rest mm -hmm. of them fall in place. Uh, so then we go down here, we got 4 BC, Herod would die here. And then we have 2 BC is a, uh, is a Shemitah, which is called out, where's that one? Uh, I can't remember exactly right offhand, but anyway, it's one of them. So now uh, there's really not much else to go off from there. So I started looking at uh, Luke chapter one. I brought this up earlier. You had uh, Zechariah, who is of the line of Abijah, and uh, he served in the temple at a certain point in time when when, uh, when John was conceived. And it goes on in the scriptures to say that in the sixth month, right, Mary went to go see Elizabeth on, in the sixth month. So in, in uh, Elizabeth's, or no, I'm sorry, the angel visited Mary in, in the sixth month. So anyway, if we, if we back, back that right. over here, so Mary's told, in the sixth month here by the messenger that she'll become pregnant with the Messiah and that Elizabeth was pregnant in her sixth month. So we have that correlation there. So if we back that up to find out when Abijah, who happens to be the eighth course, was serving, there's only a couple, two years here within that time frame, maybe three, that he could have served in that period where Elizabeth would have been pregnant six months in the sixth biblical month. If And uh, we know that Herod died 4 BC. So Yeshua had to be born prior to that because the decree to kill 
uh, all the young children two years and under there in Bethlehem. So we got a pretty good window that puts us in play there. Uh, so now that allows me to align the priestly courses with, uh, you know, with our years, basically, and then extrapolate that out. And then that takes us, let me scroll down now to where we are. So there is some speculation or some, you know, margin of error, I believe, in this, but I, I think I'm in the 85 to 90 percent you know range of being pretty confident uh 2019 would have been a year four with uh uh come all heading the year out 2022 i believe is a shemitah with shekinah leading the year and that puts us in uh so right now we are in a year seven of a uh, week five in the seventh jubilee and if that is correct, then uh, 2836 would be uh, that grand jubilee he's talking about. Which, if you look at, you know, current events, it doesn't seem too far off. You know, we could be, we could be, you know, a jubilee, a full jubilee cycle off and be 50 years out. I, I don't know. When do you think the last Shemitah was? I, I think we're in it. I think uh, I think we're in a Shemitah right now. Uh, so the one prior would have been 2015. And when you look at uh, the other yep. thing there is the, the, the Jewish reckoning of it. This year uh, was a Shemitah for them as well, except for they started it in the fall of 2019. Or, I'm sorry, 2021, because the way that they reckon their year. Right. And that's that's one of the, the very few. It's, I think it's the only thing that I actually agree with them on as far as their, uh, the way that they keep things calendar-wise. I, 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 I think, too, it's, uh, it's good to – it's good to um, – well, go ahead, Matt. You were going to say uh, something? No. I was making sure I heard you correctly. When did you the, say the, the last, last jubilee was? Like, oh, the last jubilee. Yes, sir. I thought you said Shemitah. I'm sorry. I would have been. Oh, I was right? asking both. I was asking both of them. That's a follow up question. But after yeah, Shemitah. so the, the last jubilee would have been 1987. Okay. So that will put the next one. Let's see. 2036. 2036. 2036. Okay. Oh, you got a highlighter. That's an orange or red. Yeah, I yeah. see it now. Aha, uh -huh, I see it now. All right, go ahead, Micah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's good. I just I just wanted to say too that there's a lot of people talking. They're always talking. I mean, I've been around the the truthing kind of community, not quite as much truth as I'm I've been into more recently, but since I was like 16 years old, um, I've been around end of the world people like a lot. And they're always talking, it's going to happen now, it's going to happen now, it's going to happen now. And I know a lot of people are really pointing towards the next couple of years. But if, if you go back and look um, in the prophecies, things are going to get really bad. And COVID is not that bad, you know. Like, it's not the end of the world scenario that we see no, in Revelation not. of what's actually going to be going on. So I think 2036 is a lot more likely than next year two years from now or something um yeah the mark of the, we, we've got some really hard things to start happening yeah the mark of the beast is so not you, here and you can't accidentally take it so i'll just right. say that and just right <laughs> you know what i mean well, i mean you you, you look yep, at the, the bolshevik, uh, bolshevik revolution i mean they thought the the end of the world was coming you know you look at uh I mean, some major events that happened throughout history, and you have entire civilizations that were wiped out. And for them, it's incredibly tragic and, and very apocalyptic, if you know, for lack of a better term. But huh? you know, I, I know when you read through, it's in Enoch, I believe. There's like seven different eras or ten different phases, and that last ten. one's going to be yep. a combination ten. of all of them. So, so we won't really know exactly what phase we're in because it's just it's all. It's all mixed up together. We got all of the issues all at once. So. 
I don't know. I just look at society around us, and it, it's falling apart at the seams. But you know, I, I, is it going to happen in, in 14 years? I, I don't know. I, I can't say for certain. But just based on, you know, is is it a jubilee? Yeah, I believe it is. It's a jubilee. Is it the final jubilee? I don't know. I, I really couldn't say one way or the other. Yeah. Yep. I'm I'm saying I, I I'm not gonna call it by any means. I think it uh, feels like we're getting closer. <laughs> yep. But I'm you know, not gonna I mean, call if it, it. If it's a jubilee in the way of a reset, where things are kind of put back right, which I, I hope and pray that it is, you know, because you do see that happen several times throughout history. I was alive in 1987, and I don't remember anything getting set back right. Um, you know. <laughs> right. So. I, I haven't, you know, I'm 42, so I haven't quite lived a full Jubilee cycle to see at least two of these events happen. But, you know, I, I think if you look through history, you might be able to start to put together a pattern. But again, I mean, I do also believe that the documented history that we have is, uh, um, yeah, has been skewed in, in many, many ways to throw us off. Yeah, there's no doubt. I mean, that's a whole nother topic that's not for this show, but I have a friend who <laughs> yep. pulled out some stuff uh, that is just crazy about the number of people there should be alive on earth today. Right, right. Using right. the numbers we're given online, and it's just, it's crazy. It's a whole yeah. nother ball game, man. Just simple population growth. Yeah. Yep. Should, should be, be massive compared to what they say. It is. Yeah. So something's off, but I wanted to just quickly say, uh, um, on on uh, the third from the last question, um, you had written down here for us. Uh -huh. I don't, you know, the question. I don't believe in jubilees in Enoch. You know, what do you say? I wanted to just quickly answer that because at first, my first thought when I read that question was, well, you know, we talked about it. There's no calendar really in the canon, so. Yep. You know, you're just going to have to do your best to keep it together. But there's a there's a lot uh, more important answer that I realized I personally I have come to as far as I don't believe in Jubilees and Enoch. What do I do? And that is this. People, the people who control the world uh, and then at a lower level, like seminaries and pastors like if you talk to them about these books they're not gonna they're not gonna tell you that they're some of them will say they're fraud others will just kind of like dance around it and they just don't want to talk about it and it's kind of just like quietly those books and, and apocryphal books they're just quietly frowned upon yeah. and they, they try not to make a big deal out of them and try to avoid it seems uh, letting people find out that they're out there and that there could be something to it. To me, when I find out something like that, I want to go read the, that information for myself. Not trust that somebody else... Yeah, exactly. Not trust that somebody else who may not really be trying to seek out the truth, uh, like Paul says in Second Thessalonians, you know, have a love for the truth so as to be saved, but they just want to believe what they've been taught or whatever i don't want to listen to them and i certainly don't want to listen to the powers that be like at the vatican who are who have all these books in their libraries yep. but yet they don't they don't want us to read them well why because they have information in them that really really i mean in my opinion validates and solidifies so much in scripture oh yeah so i would encourage you just step out of your box you don't have to read it with the with the thought that you automatically just because you're reading it you believe it just read it check it out test it pray about it and give it give it a try don't just ignore it and, and refuse to check it out and try it because i think you'll find some things that challenge your preconceptions but i have yet to find much of anything that actually disagrees with canon um and even canon has some errors in it. So if there is some things that don't quite line up, then you just leave those on the back shelf for now, you know. But check it out and, and just give it a read. And, and 
let it percolate in your mind and, and think about it for a while. And if you don't like it, don't like it. So, wasn't Enoch uh, originally included in the 1611 King James? I'm pretty sure it was, along with all the other apocryphal books. I don't. I, or maybe Enoch wasn't, but I, I know. I don't like, think Enoch was. Yeah, yeah, I don't think Enoch was. It was yeah. in the Hebrew canon. Yeah. It was I mean, in the Hebrew it canon, was. but it, it was it was not included. But if you if you get on just Wikipedia, this is crazy. Just go on Wikipedia and look up the councils on Wikipedia. Mm -hmm. They show you all the books that were debated as to what they whether they would put them in there or not. <laughs> yep. And you know, there's a lot more books out there. And if you look in one of the books that was included in, in uh, the apocryphal, the 1611 King James, which is Second Ezra, mm -hmm. that book tells you that there's an extra 70 books that are actually more important for us to read and know than the 24, which would be the, the canonical scripture, the, the Tanakh, the Old Testament uh, books. There's 70 more beyond those. That were considered scripture that only the only yah is only going to reveal to the wise he says so yep there's more out there and since, you, and since you mentioned uh jubilees and enoch so i've just started a series called testing jubilee so for anybody that is interested in open nice. and actually testing the book of jubilees i'm doing them on sabbath at least when i'm able to when i'm in town or whatnot starting at noon to it's about two or three hours so anybody's interested in that and it went i did the first one last sabbath and it went really well and the people in the chat really enjoyed it so something to consider if you want to join us and you're actually open to testing the book of jubilee so do y'all have since i don't have any more questions y'all have any good resources for anybody that is interested in diving deeper into research on the zadok calendar Besides your websites, which right. are in the, I'm, I, I would the honestly area. recommend that you pick up a copy or a couple of copies of the Dead Sea Scrolls and just read them. Uh, there's a lot to be gleaned from them. I mean, the Psalms are beautiful. There's you, you get a sense yeah. of the of their community and, and their their devoutness. You know how important it was to them to to walk righteously i mean there's there's yep. there's a lot a lot in there that i think that we can apply to our lives that goes beyond the calendar study and then you can sit down and spend the time and the hours and, and start looking through and trying to decode the calendar documents as we have and overlay it with the information that you come across online and uh you know and and, and start testing that stuff for yourself uh i mean that's honestly where i was sorry i i've I've thoroughly enjoyed reading through those documents. I really have. Yeah. I would agree. The Sabbath, the Sabbath Psalms in the Dead Sea Scrolls are amazing. And, and interestingly, the first Sabbath Psalm says uh, that it was written for the fourth day of the first month. So that sets your whole calendar right there. The fourth day of the first month is the first Shabbat on the, on the calendar. And it was written by David, according to the scrolls. The first Sabbath psalm written by David. So nice. there is a lot of nuggets in there. The only, the only caution I would give, I think you should read it, but just understand that, in my opinion, okay, um, the powers that be in this realm want you to believe that the Essenes wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls, okay? And... I think it's possible that some of the documents contained within the Dead Sea Scrolls we've been written, uh, been given may have been written by the Essenes. But if you just do some basic research, you can find that the beliefs written in the Dead Sea Scrolls don't line up with the beliefs of the Essenes. So understand that there may be things in the book you buy that don't make sense and don't line up like a horoscope or um there are yeah, things so, weird yeah, things in there. Uh, yeah yeah and then there's um like the the uh one document called the works of the law in there and i you know i always like people question me about this all the time and i like to say this i have a, a library of books if you based what i believed off of my library of books 
you would throw out everything I have to say because I've had some people give me books they want me to read, which is terrible about getting to reading books, but that <laughs> I think are terrible books, but they want me to read them because they want me to like actually have, have given an educated answer to why I think it's wrong. Okay. And I'm going to burn them once I read them, if I can ever get to it because they're <laughs> horrible, but like that's, and they're not like immoral. They're just things from ancient, ancient writings and stuff that are from the devil, you know, but, but anyways, you can't just because they had one text that doesn't have some things in it that match doesn't mean that they were bad. They were wrong that, that they were, they were, uh, you know, the Essenes, which is what the narrative that the, the world is pushing is that they were the Essenes. So don't read their stuff. I don't, I don't believe that personally. So, I mean, there's a lot of evidence for the fact that the Essenes actually were living in the Getty. Yeah, they were, they were a, mon a monastic group, so they were celibate men. And when you read the community scrolls or the community rules, yep. it has everything to do with like family life and, and, and the roles of a family in the community. And, um, you know, I, you look at, at John the Baptist, he was out in the wilderness. Well, where at in the wilderness? He was, he was baptizing in the Jordan, which emptied right there at the top of, of the Dead Sea, right where... I know that community would have been, and there's there's so many ties in Bethabara. Yeah, Bethabara, and and with John being you know Zachariah's son, so he was in the the lineage of the priest of of the Zadok you know priest, and and that's where they they went when they were exiled during the Maccabean thing. So it's um, uh -huh. yeah, I, I I totally agree. I don't. I don't think the Essenes at all had uh, any part to do with that community, but yeah, they may have had a document here or there, or maybe they got put in place to help discredit um, what was really right. going on there. Right. Yep. yep. Beyond beyond that book, though, I would say uh, My House Ministries has a YouTube channel. My House Ministries, just look My House Ministries up on YouTube, and we've got eight or nine videos in there i think um that will help you some of them are going a lot greater detail on specific topics um so check that out it's the Zadik calendar playlist on on there and um reach out if you have questions i know matt and i would both be happy to uh answer questions I, you know i love even getting on the phone and talking to people if you reach out privately um so reach out. I don't like to share too many other people's information because there's just things that I, I don't agree with. And if I give yeah. all kinds of other information out, I don't know. I, I just like to share what, what I believe and they can find the other information. You just do a search on the calendar. If you want to go find other people, there's plenty of them out there. So, so I'll do this to make it easy for people. I just pulled it up on my phone. So I'll share that playlist you just mentioned and I'll pin that as a comment whenever the streams over so it'll be easily accessible for people. There you go. So this is awesome, brothers. Ventura is light .org. Yep. That yeah, I got that one in the description already. So so this is awesome, brother. Okay. We covered a lot, a lot of ground and I, I appreciate y'all's time and thank you everyone in the chat. I hope this is a blessing to a lot of people. So we're gonna jump off here and say shalom. 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 Shalom.